I've never seen anything like this before in my life. I'm, I'm terrified. If you make one mistake, your life's over like that. And they're screaming, get on the ground now, don't effing move now. He hoists me up. He's like, English Sean, you're a big name for the rave scene and we finally got you. 1980s, 70s prison systems, man. It was just barbaric. I know you flown me out here to set me up for a drug deal. And G-Dog puts a gun to the cop's head and says the only one who's not leaving is you, motherfucker. That's the difference between crystal meth and speed. You feel superhuman though when you first take it. Podcast Wars began when two of those guys you just mentioned tested the water by doing an attack on me. And when you go after elites who are doing those heinous things to kids, you go through hell. These guys jumped on the bandwagon, didn't they? In a concerted attempt to try and destroy my reputation and steal my subscribers. Colin, what matters to me now is my son. I just hold him and I just melt. And like everything that's going on in that day on the phone or in emails or anything, I hold him and I'm fucking. What's going on, people? Welcome to the Central Club. This episode is brought to you by Reinspire Printing and the City Arms. If you haven't already, make sure you hit that like button, subscribe to the club, and hit the bell button to be notified of future content. The world of podcasting is big business now, and it's only going to grow. In every city, in every country, of every genre, there will always be a podcast to represent it. It truly is the preferred way to educating and informing the mass in 2024. And although some would say it's not just competitive, but saturated, the beauty is there's enough for all creators to succeed and enough content for all listeners to consume. You can almost learn anything through a podcast. And of course, with any business boom, there are pioneers, founders, originators. And in this country in particular, we're mixing true crime and podcasting together. There's only one man that stands out from the rest. Not only known for podcasting, being an author or a speaker, but also being known for a kingpin, a drug kingpin. And mixed with mine and the public's opinion, it gives me my pleasure to introduce you. Mr. Sean Atwood. Colin, well, appreciate that, man. I'm looking around, where is this man? <laughs> I'd, like, I'd like to say, well, I come here today and gave Colin a hug. He's massive. I thought I was hugging wild, man. I've been watching this podcast religiously. Great work. I had no idea how big he is. <laughs> no, I know. It's my posture. When I sit here and I'm like this, it's my terrible posture that makes me look smaller. But thank you. Behind the desk, like a little schoolboy, and then you meet him in person. <laughs> like, <Yeah>. whoa. <laughs> and I want to say thank you, you know, to, you know, to remind, you know, I know how much, how special Wild Man was to you, how much you hold him in, in high regard. So thank you for that. Yeah, and I've got some stories about him we get to and i just shout out to lee marvin hitchman and yeah. care as well for hooking this up great people and you know when i when i interviewed lee marvin you know at the beginning the end and when we wasn't even filming he was always putting you in high regard of, oh. of not just being able to platform you but also you know kind of guiding him in certain ways as well yeah he's really, he really is grateful for you having read his book born in prison and seeing what he's gone through oh my god you know the, the fact that he's still alive even and he's he's so spiritual, he's like a spiritual warrior now. It's so inspirational. Yeah, I, I love his posts. You know, it's like <laughs> his universal posts and stuff on Instagram. Honestly, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, out there, isn't he, you know? <laughs> but it's better than being a, you know, a thieving crack user who's, you know, on, on the verge of death. Indeed, yes. You know? <laughs> and Chun, how are you, mate? Well, we've got little baby Ziggy, middle name Wilder after Wildman. That's lovely. He's in over one year old clothes already. He's only approaching six months. He's massive. He was 10 pounds at birth and Jen was in hospital for two weeks and two days in labor. So everything's all good. Jen's been through a lot and um, we've moved recently. So we're near a, where Jen's family can help out and stuff. Yeah. Good, yeah. good. How was that? Was that a big decision for you to move? Well, 
I've had quite a few upheavals throughout my life, so yeah. it wasn't the biggest one. I've... <laughs> yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah I, know um, what I, I quite like going to a new environment. Okay. And Bristol, the energy in Bristol, the people we've met, the restaurants, the vibe, how much different stuff there is. I'm loving it. Do you think I like the roundabouts? Yeah, 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 yeah. I agree there. <laughs> I think people, I think Bristol does get overlooked quite a lot as a, as a great city within England, you know, because it's, it's very big, it's very diverse, you know, multicultural, um, a lot of history, but it just seems to be, it's always like, you know, the London, Birmingham, Liverpool, Manchester, and Newcastle maybe, you know, Bristol gets overlooked. Definitely. I did a few talks there over the years, but I never got to look around properly. And mm. now I'm looking around, I'm like, wow, I didn't miss this. Yeah. Didn't realize how big it was. Oh, it, it is a big place. Yeah. It is a massive place. And it's uh, a lot of history. Like I said, I think that's where like a lot of the py pirating happened. You know, it was like, I think it's, you know, maybe uh, not as proud to be remembered, but it was like the capital of the slave trade, like those mm. routes there, Bristol, you know, so yeah. it's a fascinating place, you know? Yeah. So you are, like I said in the introduction, you are one of the originators. You are one of the reasons, you know, whether I, 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 I consciously know it, one of the reasons why I started podcasting, you started very, very early on, maybe not as a podcaster, but as a YouTube channel. And looking at YouTube and podcasting now, how, how do you feel about the, how it is? Do you feel like there's too much or do you feel like it's, it, it's wonderful? Like what? So just give a bit of backstory then. So when I was in the Max Security Madison Street Jail 2004, my writing was smuggled out. I forgot out. about that bit, sorry. <laughs> that was smuggled out and it became a blog called John's Jail Journal, which people can read. It's still up there, timestamp, documenting my journey through the jail. And then when I got released in 2007, I hijacked uh, my dad's YouTube channel. <laughs> he had a video of him on te in Tenerife in a Queen uh, band playing. <laughs> and uh, I hijacked his channel. And that's when the, the YouTube channel started. So we, we did videos like how to survive Sheriff Gerard Pires jail. But I didn't really go full on on YouTube until about six, seven years ago, I would reckon. Um, Making a Murder came out around then. We did a lot on that. True Geordie invited me onto his channel. And after I went on True Geordie, and shout out to Brian and Lawrence, um, the subs just kept going up from that, from then. Yeah. Wow. Just just to go take that into context. So your dad's YouTube channel <laughs> is now uh, one of the biggest true crime channels uh, across the world, really. The channel that was formerly Derek Atwood. <laughs> <laughs> wow. That's really fascinating. Yeah. Isn't it, you know? God bless my dad. He still works on it. Yeah, sure. I did, did you have him involved with him and stuff? There's about 20 people working on it, including my dad. <laughs> Legend. But he got to have his say, haven't he? You know, you know, it was his channel. <laughs> it was his channel. I bet he says that from time to time. <laughs> so, can I put one of my guitar videos on there? I just want to promote myself, you know? Brian May. <laughs> yeah, brilliant. No, well, yeah, it, it seems, you know, we might have just gone over that fascinating part of your of your life. But as people might not know, you are the author to Hard Times. And if anyone hasn't uh, read this book, um, where can they get this? Yeah, so all my books are on Amazon. There's 17 of them at the last count. Sit Downs with Gangsters came out last year, which is each chapter is about one of my most hard-hitting podcast guest stories. And then my... Jimmy Savile Untouchable book came out just before yeah. Christmas. We he got... looks like the big show off the, the wrestler, the big show. He's got Hannibal Lecter's eyes, that guy above me. We actually took him out and put wow. him on him. Yeah. And yeah, you know, you was in a max security uh, prison in America. Um, how many years did you do in total? All right, so I was arrested May 16th, 2002. Went through some processing facilities got assigned to medium security towers jail with wild man my first year second year got moved over to the maximum security madison street jail that was for the next wasn't just 12 months i was in on remand for 26 months after 26 months i got sentenced prosecutor gave a, me a big f you because we wouldn't cooperate and she pulled out all these dirty tricks she accidentally put my nine and a half year sentence down as 34 years to the prison system so I got fast-tracked to Supermax, where I wasn't supposed to be. That took about three or four months to fix. Then I ended up in medium security, then minimum security. This is Arizona Department of Corrections now. 
after the jail. The jail's separate. That's all uh, Maricopa County jail system. And then federal deportation prison at the end of it and Connor. Connor? <laughs> yeah. You, you, you actually went on a... Well, Connor, yeah. Wow, I didn't yeah. know that. Have you watched that movie with Nicholas? Brilliant film, yeah, yeah. you know. Uh, Cyrus the Virus, come on. <laughs> John Malkovich, what an actor. On this particular Connor, because it's all Mexicans getting deported and me... Mexico <laughs> first. <laughs> I'm sat there with all Mexicans. By now I've picked up a bit of the lingo. So they're asking me to communicate with these redneck guards. And the redneck guards are not, you know, they're, they're pieces of work. The classical aviator sunglasses, chewing tobacco, all that kind of thing. And um, federal marshals are on the plane. You're all sh shackled up. Yeah, good luck asking for to go to the toilet. <laughs> and they're just flying around, dropping off and picking up Mexicans. And the federal marshals, so there's like rows of us. And then there's like a row of federal marshals just like this. Armed and everything, staring at you. Just yeah, yeah. Wow, that's <laughs> crazy. You've you've lived quite a wild life, haven't it you? It was an interesting experience. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So take us to that. So so you're from? How did we get there? Right. You're from the north of England, I I believe. In a yeah, from Widnes, chemical Witness. manufacturing town. Yeah. Didn't grow up with much money. Got interested in the stock market as a teenager, and my economics teacher, Mister Dillon, started giving me classes on my own. And he'd get the Financial Times out and he'd read all the numbers. And I went down with this library, ordered dozens of books on the subject. So while I, I was this nerd studying the stock market, I, I, my best mate was a maniac. And that relationship, Wild Man, came about because there was a gang of lads, not like gangs you hear these days. We were kind of innocent. We watched too many movies like The Wanderers and The Warriors. Great films. And we called ourselves the Sweats. <laughs> anyway, Wildman's oldest brother was the leader of this gang. Wildman is two years younger than me, so he was younger than all of us in this gang, which included his cousin, Hammy. Um, he would be cruel to Wildman and tell him you can join the gang if you eat dog shit and things like that, make him do it, and then send him home. <laughs> so I ended up splintering off with Hammy, Wildman's cousin, and clicking up with Wildman, and we just formed our own trio. And that's how this bond formed. And there was a tree at the top of my town overlooking a quarry called Pex Hill Quarry. And we call it the thinking tree. So we'd sit on the thinking tree and we'd be like, what are you gonna do when you grow up kind of thing? And I'd be like, yeah, I'm gonna go to America, make a million, fly you guys over. And Hammy would say to Wildman, what are you gonna do? And he'd be like, I'm going to prison. I've got red dots in my head telling me to hurt people. Now at his school, he had these red dots and he'd grown huge. He was 29 and a half stone and six foot two when he died. Red dots? Red dots, time to hurt people. He was picking up teachers and putting them in rubbish bins and stuff at, at his school. This is just high school. They were so scared of him. They had him outside raking leaves with the caretaker. He'd show up at my house after the weekend looking like he'd been hit by a train. And I'd be like, Peter, what's happened? What's happened? Oh yeah, I've been downtown, top of the town. and. Fighting the bouncers, ah, I love it. Ah. Yeah, I it looked that. like it just, yeah. So that was him, and that was me. We were the opposites, <laughs> but we had a complementary skill set. Let's say yeah. that later on, the bronze and the brain became the basis for the criminal enterprise. Yeah. So you fly over to America. Yes. Um, and, and was that for stocks originally, or no? Have you already... It sounds fancy, stockbroker, but if you've watched The Wolf of Wall Street, you know, you know it's just glorified telesales. They want at the job, my boss slaps the phone book down and says, you've got to call 500 numbers a day to find people to buy shares. And it was commission only. So I was living off cheese on toast and bananas my first couple of years, worried I was going to have to come home. But five years in, I was the top guy, grossing half a million in commissions, got my own secretary, my own cold callers. Well, that aggression on the phone was fueled by crystal meth. So instead of asking people for 5,000 or 10,000, once I got a meth, I was asking people for 50,000 or 100,000. So my numbers on the board went through the roof. Um, we'd have these like, they're like military drill sergeant fucking sales meetings where there's this big board, right? And all the rookie brokers are sat there and they're screaming at us, your numbers, 
You're only as big as your numbers on this board for the month. Smiling brokers make the most money. Have mirrors on your quads. Pacing brokers make the most money. We had to have like 24 foot curly cords so we could pace. If you're calling your wives, if you're calling your girlfriends, other brokers are calling your clients. And then they're like, where are you at this board for the month? And it smashed the board. <laughs> it's like. I've seen like. I have seen like people and they're like, you know, cult heroes maybe on Instagram and stuff. Now they got a big following and they're, they're exactly like you just said, like it's And I'm fresh fanatical. out of uni. <laughs> I'm thinking, I think it, is this the business world? So when you watch Wolf of Wall Street, did you have some of that? Flashbacks like, all yeah. the way through, man. They had biker gangs dropping off crystal meth. Any reason for a celebration, there'd be a limo full of strippers downstairs, straight off to the strip club. <laughs> They were snorting coke off their desks. They were all like macho New York, who can eat the most balls, balls kinds of guys. Was was this in New York? No, this was in Phoenix, Arizona. You went straight to Phoenix, did you? Yeah, because I've got family members there over the years. For example, when I was 16, I'd visit my aunt in Arizona. <sighs> she was a bit of a mentor to me in uh, in doing dodgy things. She changed my date of birth, my passport, so I was 16 and took me out nightclub and you gotta be 21 up there. And she's introduced me to all these beautiful American women as Paul McCartney's nephew. So I'm thinking, I'm just a nobody from witness this chemical manufacturing town where it rains a lot. I'm flying into Phoenix, Arizona, where you look out the windows of the planes and you see all these swimming pools in the backyards. The sun's always out. They hear my English accent and they roll up the red carpet. But now I'm Paul McCartney's nephew and I've got all these fit birds want to hang out and dance at the zoo's nightclub on Camelback Mountain was the place where she was taking me. I'm like, this is paradise. I want some of this when I finish my education. Yeah, yeah, I, mate. <laughs> it's, it's, it's any any young teenager's dream. Oh, yeah. You know? yeah. So that is where you, you 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 was making your beeline for there then. Did you kind of set up kind of contacts before you went out to do the stocks or was it literally like, I'll go to my aunties or my family members and just look for I did have. I had various options when I got my degree in business studies and one of them was to be an investment analyst. So I was going to these job interviews competing against independent school kids who were flying in under helicopters and I'm, you know, just from a public school in Widnes. Yeah, I've got my degree, but I didn't stand a chance at these investment banks. And my aunt Sue was just like, just jump on a plane, come out here. Yeah. You do great with your English accent. Yeah. Well, yeah. yeah. But but just quickly, just I would like to know, why do you think you didn't stand a chance because of that um, inferiority maybe, you know, the, 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 the class, was it that or? What I've learned now from researching elite, there's a class structure that controls the world and every country has got a class structure. And if you're bred into that class, you get those opportunities that that class protects and services them. Yeah. It's a shit way to live really, isn't it? You know, well, it's a shit, uh, shit, a shit truth of circumstances. You draw a parallel in one of your podcasts I think it was Act, he mentioned these people are on yachts. And you said, yeah, and we've got our dinghies. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. So, yeah, okay. So Arizona it was. How did... So you, you, I didn't know you was taking crystal meth, Sean. Yeah. Can you describe what, what that was like? <clears throat> Have you tried British Speed? Yeah. yeah. So you get a wrap... A gram in a wrap, don't you? I used to do that when I was at the raves in Manchester and Liverpool. I'll give you an example then. Wild man's cousin, Hammy, flew over with his best mate, his drinking partner, while I was still working in the stock market. And I went, I said to them, help yourselves to anything that's in the safe. And I went to work. I forgot that they were used to doing a gram of speed and that the safe had crystal meth in it. So when I got home from work, they'd been doing grams of crystal meth. Wow. I went to bed that night. I woke up and they were still having the same conversation. I thought, all right, I need to get these guys chilled out. They've drank about 30 cans of Budweiser each and the, it's just not having any impact on them. So I'll take them to LA and we'll go to some strip bar clubs and we'll get, get them chilled out with the women. And um, 
anyway, it's, there's a very long chapter about that story in Party Time, but it culminates in Hammy's drinking partner getting so paranoid after three days or four days of being up on all this meth, he throws his luggage at me on Sunset Boulevard and says, I know you've flown me out here to set me up for a drug deal, throws all his money at me and says, I know my fingerprints, my fingerprints are on this money, you set me up for this drug deal and took off like a wolf on Hassid down Sunset Boulevard and I never saw him again. Hammy was searching for him for a day or so and he felt so bad he went home on the fourth day of a holiday that was supposed to last a month. That's the difference between crystal meth and speed. You feel superhuman though when you first take it. You don't sleep for days, you don't eat, you lose weight and you don't think you need to sleep or eat. And I was on the phone just... Wow. Making tens of thousands of pounds. But the paranoia comes with it as an after. In the beginning... Paranoia's not there, yeah. but over time, the only time, I mean, Wild Man <clears throat> got insanely paranoid because I ate meth or I snorted it, but Wild Man would just smoke unlimited amount of drugs, which is probably one of the reasons why he's dead, crack and meth. And he would always think, after he's been up for so many days, and sometimes he would stay for two weeks, that, that the Mexicans or someone was coming to kill him. Now, the only time, he never ever turned on me, but there was one time that he did. So I've got this bouncer in my car, with me, we're riding shotgun and Wild Man's in the back. And I've been telling this bouncer stories about Wild Man. And uh, he was like thinking, oh, this, you know, you're embellishing this stuff. And the bouncer said to me, yeah, now Wild Man's here. I met him and he gave me a bird hug and he just picked me up and threw me around like I was a rag doll. And this was a big guy. He's like, yeah, yeah, everything you're saying about him is true. So me and, I'll call him because I've got to change people's names. We'll call him Rossetti. Me and Rosetti are in the front and Wildman's in the back. And I'm looking in the mirror at the front and Wildman's eyes, he just looks like the devil when he's been up for days, they're just completely blood red. So I'm looking in the mirror and these blood red eyes are just like, just nodding at me like this. I'm like, what's going on, Peter? He's like, I know, I know what's going on. I'm like, Peter, what do you mean what's going on? Peter, what do you mean? Where are we taking you? You guys are taking me out to the desert. And I'm thinking, if he really thinks that, I've seen him in action. In a second, he could just snap and do something. So we've got to talk him down. Generally, what we did, we, we, we put um, Xanax in a drink and, and make, him, make him drink something. It was the only way to get him under control. <laughs> but he did, he did tell me later on that was the only time he was thinking about killing me. Wow. And and, uh, and Rosetti there, but generally he was very protective. But because of the way he behaved, he did attract a lot of mayhem. I can imagine. Yeah, yeah. yeah. We all got a friend like that, haven't we? <laughs> <laughs> um, so, how did you go from this stockbroker? Obviously, it's a, probably a natural progression, but from someone who has got a, a legit job, you're starting to go downhill by taking meth, and you've got wild man over. How did you end up becoming? someone who was selling a lot of ecstasy and gets caught and ends up going to an American prison. All right. Wild Man's first visit, like, was me fulfilling the promise I made to him on the thinking tree. I flew him out. I was in a relationship at the time, and I was doing good in the stock market, but I'd already been introduced to meth. And while, me and Wild Man were doing meth, ecstasy, everything. And we were partying 24-7. And there came a point where... I decided to make an experiment of going out to LA to buy, I think, 500 or 1,000 pills or something because we could only get 50 to 100 off the local guys and we were getting inundated requests from them. That's part, I was just showing off, giving them away for free because I was making so much money and uh, attracting new friends through that. And then we went out and bought these pills and they, they all went in one weekend. So I said to myself, do I need to be working these long hours six o'clock in the morning sales meeting, you know, on the phones all day, or do I just want to sack that and make money from the party scene? And because of that fateful decision, I had a lot of crazy wild times, but I lost absolutely everything. And the boss at the stock brokerage, he cottoned on as well and he gave me a warning. Here's what happened, right? So I was in my car, in the car park outside the stock brokerage, counting cash on my lap. And his secretary was 
come to the car next to mine. She was parked and she saw it. And the next day he said, he called me into the, his office and he said, Sean, you're at a crossroads in your life right now. You can just keep working hard and going on that track of slow and steady progress and be a big producer and, you know, have everything you want. Or you can go down this road, his eyes widen like it leads to hell. And I didn't listen to him. Do, if you could go back in time, would you have made the same decision? Would you have done anything different? You know what? The school kids ask me that because uh, I do drugs education and I tell them yes and no because it's hard to answer that. Especially to kids. Um, you know, I do the same thing. Yeah, most of my mates are dead who I parted with back then. Every year another one goes. So I would say about 10 of my closest male friends are dead from dying in their 20s to the 40s while mum was in his 40s, multiple organ failure. Um, my mum had a nervous breakdown over my situation. My sister had to have counselling. So obviously if I could reverse all that and not have that happen, I would. Um, on the other hand, I had to go through the things I've gone through to learn lessons and mature as a human being. I mean, I was out of control. I was emotionally mature, didn't have any common sense. And it was only through incarceration of almost six years, I was forced to go inside myself sober after being off my face for so long and address the root causes of my addiction and learn a lot about my own psychology. Cause living with 90% of the guys I was living with were heroin, hardcore heroin users, two thirds had a hep C from showing dirty needles. And just hearing the sad stories and understanding about addiction, all these professors that teach things, they should go and live with the users for years and years and years to understand the trajectory of addiction. It's based in trauma. A lot of them have been victims of pedos and stuff like that and weren't given the tools to deal with it and end up on these hardcore drugs. And people are afraid to go inside themselves to look at what's in there because they're scared of what they might find. And I was one of those people. I was just taking drugs, taking drugs, taking drugs. And I was forced to go on that inner journey. Yeah. It's really fascinating because I do a lot of public speaking and, you know, if it's to kids and stuff, when they ask that question, it's the same kind of... Uh, catch 22 because you know i want to promote that it's never too late to change yeah and you can go through adversity you can you know, commit crimes or but you don't want to prom you don't want them kids to think well okay then i'm going to try and become a drug dealer and if it fails i can be like cullen and you know turn it around and live that life yeah i don't want to promote that yeah i want to i want to give them the inspiration that it's never too late and you can turn it around yeah but i don't want to give them the <laughs> keys to do that so I, I totally understand what you say there from the answer, from the answer you've given, you know, and, and like what you do now, mm. you love what you do, you're good at what you do. So you would, you know, you must sit there sometimes and say, you know, I'm glad I went through this to, to be the man I am today. Yeah, because these kids, they, uh, I get an email like years later saying, I saw you on this and I just want to say I saw you in my school and because of your talk, I've stayed on the straight and narrow, but I was oh. close to doing this. I was getting involved in that and I started. That, that's, that's the meaning of that's life, the isn't it? the meaning of life. Yeah, man. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's wonderful, mate. Like, yeah. In, uh, yeah, like I, I totally understand what you're saying. And just to quickly touch on, you're bang on as well about these psych, you know, these uh, professionals, these people who go to university to become drug counsellors and whatever. You are right. They, they, they do, they do need to... Uh, kind of dig more rather than just reading from a textbook now yeah. i always say the best kind of drugs counselor or drugs worker is someone who has been had that lived experience definitely but then takes the time to learn what they've learned by the professional book because you're never going to get a professional who's going to say i know i'm going to become a heroin addict for two months just to see <laughs> you're not going to get that yeah. But you can have someone who's been through there to then go the other side mm -hmm. and still learn the, 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 you know, the textbook. Yeah. And that's what I'm trying to do now. You know, I, I lived it for 12 years and mm -hmm. now I'm trying to become a, a better person. I would never go into services and say, I know everything. I was like, you haven't got a clue because I don't know the professional side. Yeah. But I'm learning that way. And I, I think you just hit the nail on the head with that. And it's a lifelong thing, learning about ourselves. It never ends because we're changing and evolving constantly yeah. as well. We're, we're changing and evolving and everything around us is too, yeah. you know? Yeah. Everything around us is too. How much did you make, would you say then, when you, on your enterprise of, 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 of oh selling Oh my goodness. Drugs? So we've got a documentary coming out with Sammy the Bull in August 
and it's going to be <coughs> massive. It's on a platform in America that's got over 100 million um, people pay to watch. Wow. Um, one of the biggest networks. And the legal people had to go over it all to calculate it. And the sales was in the tens of millions. Yeah. Yeah, and the profit was in the millions. Yeah. That's what I can remember off the top of my head. And the courts will probably say it's, you know, double the price, you know, when they say street value and stuff is, you know, like when the, when I done the restorative justice just on the one chain of shops, they estimated like 2.8 million of stolen goods in four years. I never made 2.8 million pounds. Exactly. I sold it a third of the fucking price. Exactly. You know, but... So if I'm bringing in... I think the most we ever did in one shipment was 40,000 pills. Wow. So if I'm bringing that in, we're paying a couple of dollars and they're going for 25, 30. People think I'm making a couple of dollars to 25, 30, but I'm not. If I've got 10 to 20 people working under me uh, at the peak of it, at the heads of each faction, let's say, and I would front them, say 5,000 at like seven, eight or 10 or whatever. It's a thousand, it's 10. Um, so I'm only making from two or three to seven or two or three to 10. And then they've got their middle guy and then they've got their street guy. So it, there's different. Yeah. Where was you sourcing the drugs from then? So in the very beginning, it started with me. We were at a rave and there was this Native American guy, one of, one of my, became one of my best friends. He's dead as well. Acid Joey, he was dancing like he was a stocky guy, but he was dancing like his body was water. And I'm thinking, he's on some good stuff. So I wait till he was outside <laughs> and I hit him up. And I'm like, yeah, can you hook us up? So he hooked us up, but he could only get 50 to 100. But he found out that the locals were getting them from this guy out of L.A. So two carloads of us went out to L.A. Um, there was me and Wild Man in one car. There was Acid Joey and Seth in the other car. Seth was a big guy. He started doing meth with Wild Man, ended up throwing the computer at our boss and got fired. And then he ended up <laughs> collecting crack debts for the Colombians with Wild Man in Central Phoenix. But anyway, all those guys went out to L.A. They're all dead now. And we were waiting for this guy, and he's not at his house. Wild man's like, I'm just going to go in and smash his door down and take his shit. <laughs> and I'm like, guys, you've got to keep Wild Man under control. This is not good business if we want to have a regular thing going. In the end, this guy shows up. Have you seen that movie Point Break? With the surf, yeah, yeah, surf of gangsters. Yeah. Um, who's in there? Patrick Swayze. Yeah, in. They, those guys Gallery. exist. Those guys exist. Surf of really? gangsters. Yeah. So I go in his house. I, I tell them... Look, if I'm not out in 10 minutes, then break the door down. <laughs> was these surfer gangsters in there. The guy's got this, uh, gives me a, I think it was a Mitsubishi. I throw it in my mouth. He says, do you want to chase? I said, no, I want to taste it. So I just chew it in front of him. And I know what good ecstasy tastes like. I'm like, yeah, this this tastes good. So he gets the pills. I hand over the bills. Biggest bag I've ever seen in my life. And then we get, um, I'm shitting it, by the way, because I've never done anything like this before in my life. I'm thinking, are these guys going to jack me? Are the cops going to be waiting outside? But once the E hit, <laughs> I was in a twin turbo Mazda RX-7 with a Bose surround system like you see in Fast and Furious 1. <laughs> I've got a furry, uh, what's, I don't know what the fur was, sheepskin or something, seats. And we've got Sasha playing, DJ Sasha, Renaissance, that's a CD. And um, I'm coming up on my E and I could just feel the fur just starting to tickle the back of my head <laughs> and I'm coming up, I'm coming up and then there's, there's the sasha kicks in and all the goosebumps and I'm rolling. This was before I was sensible. I'm driving home at speeds of up to 150 miles an hour and um, we got back off our faces and just sold those, those pills in a weekend. People were coming from and asking for like um, 50, 100 at a time and they were just gone, yeah. Wow. But then... The guy I was out of LA either got arrested or stopped getting them. Else, things happened. Yeah. So we figured out they're getting them from Holland, and then we started getting them from Holland. But I lost a few smugglers uh, through airports. So we consulted someone who was an expert in smuggling methods, a lawyer, and the lawyer said start bringing them in through Mexico. So then we had operations. Went to see a lawyer. So this is these people exist, like do they? Like <laughs> lawyers call, to tell better you how call to bring Saul. Them. Better call Saul. They exist. Yeah, I had one of them, and um, she said, "Start bringing them in through Mexico." So, if you're bringing stuff in through Mexico, what, are you saying Holland to Mexico or just source a link in right. Mexico? Ultimately, here's how it went: Holland train over to France, for example, which was our main route. Air France to Mexico City. 
Mexico City to Hermosillo Airport. So you're going then from this side of Mexico to the Arizona, California side of Mexico. Now, I invested in property uh, in Puerto Penasco, Rocky Point, uh, where I put the wild ones, wild men and wild women, who paved the way for this really down there with the locals and the police by paying them all off. Is, is that still in Arizona or is that in Mexico? In, this is in Mexico. Mexico. This is how we established Mexico. Um, so the wild ones, wild man, got in with all the locals. My mates in Arizona said if wild man behaves like he behaves in Mexico, the Mexicans will kill him. And the first house they went in, him and Wild Woman, was blown up. And I thought they had killed him, but that was just them having a domestic. And they'd sm they'd smashed the gas pipe and stopped for a smoke break. So just <laughs> quickly, just for, for the people to know this, um, I've seen an interview with Wild, Wild Woman. Yeah. So they were a couple, were they? Yes. She is like, I, I, I know people like her. She, You just know she is fucking balmy nuts scary yes. and, and together like i can just imagine the two of them they were like the ones off pulp fiction who rob at the end exactly the, the robbery at the end she's got a tumor Tim Roth is she's in. got a tumor on one of her glands that causes her to go psychotic within <laughs> seconds wow yeah <laughs> some people most go to her than him in the surveillance the police have a video of her chasing after wildman down the street with a giant fan trying to smash his head in <laughs> <laughs> I can't believe you put them down in Mexico. That's mad. Yeah, so my mates said they would get killed. I sent a guy down there to check up on them because we didn't have any way of communicating with them. And the house had blown up and we thought they were killed. But they just had a domestic, smashed the gas pipe, stopped for a smoke break, and the whole house had blown up. <laughs> <laughs> what I did is finally find out where they were. Oh, I to, fucking hell. That's I, brilliant. I had, a, I had a guy working for me, Frankie Flowers. He was an ex-US uh, military sniper who was Hispanic. He spoke Spanish. I had to send him down there wow. on a mission to find them. And um, cartel guys were running around in military jeeps when I finally went down there tr trying to get me to do business with them. We're, we're, we're driving... Driving Pete around in, in military around. jeeps, calling him El Oso de Burr because of his fighting style. <laughs> he could have been on Bloodsport or something. <laughs> <laughs> That's fucking brilliant. Wow. And did, did, did you ever think you would get caught? No, you don't. The drugs is selling you. You're Mr. Cool Guy. You're above the law. We were Joe. We're above the law. We're never going to get caught. Um, in fact, the bouncer that Wildman picked up through like ran like a rag doll. When I first saw him after everyone had been arrested, he said to me, so much for us all being above the law, eh? <laughs> Fucking brilliant. That's quality, mate. <laughs> Did your mother and father oh, know what you was getting oh up to? Oh, my God, man. I don't know if you've seen my Bang the Reboard episode, but it shows... They visited me and there was a knock at the door. So my parents chilling out in the living room watching, I think it was Die Hard with Bruce Willis. Right. And um, there's this knock at the door. And I go to the door and I see some people that I don't recognize, but they look a bit edgy. So I think, right, I'm just going to grab my shotgun, just display it, you know, in case there's a situation here. Now, that might may sound unusual to you, but in Arizona, which has guns... A lot of people got guns in the glove compartments. A Same way of having a baseball bat in, in you know, yes, just a bit of safety. Equivalent. Yeah. Um, I did a concealed... It's not the equivalent, of course. They're two <laughs> different things. <laughs> I had I, I'd gone to a shooting range and got a concealed weapons permit, did all the training by ex-cops, and I'd, I'd been granted that permit. And they at this shooting range, they teach you what you can and can't do, how to kill someone effectively if your life is in imminent danger. And the best weapon for home protection is a shotgun. So I had this shotgun handy. And when these guys came, I said to my parents, keep watching the movie. Because it was quite a distance. I thought I could just discreetly get this shotgun and go to so the door. So your parents are in the house. Yeah, watching Die Hard. So, so yeah, just say that again. So your parents. <laughs> yeah, they've flown over from Witness. Yeah. Having a lovely vacation. They're watching Die Hard in the living room. And there's a knock at the front door. And I look through the people, see that these people I don't know, they're a bit edgy. If I answer the door and I've got a shotgun, it, it might be a deterrent from them trying to come in or do something. Wow. And, and who were the people? Around? Next thing was I opened the door and said, what's up? And they said, 
we're told Acid Joey lives here. Acid Joey's the guy I mentioned earlier. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Acid Joey, RIP. He was found dead in his swimming pool with all his clothes on. He used to do a lot of acid, a lot of ketamine. Um, so no I said, foul play, no. No, no. Most of my friends just did themselves in. Yeah. So I said to them, Acid Joey doesn't live here. And they said, well, he owes us money. And I said, well, he owes me money. And they said, well, how are we going to get our money back? And I said, he's in San Francisco. He's trying to score right now. And when he comes back, you need to talk to him about getting your money and not coming here because I, I'm i here and my family's here and appreciate if you guys would go away and they did note the shotgun and they did go away wow yeah I could have escalated that, that in it could have but they were from the rave scene um they wasn't yeah. they wasn't the kind of people I got involved with later on yeah like the New Mexico Mafia so you got involved with them before you got sent to prison, I assume? Oh, yeah, yeah. They were had my back. Yeah. I'll give you a story if you want. Yeah, give us a story when, when, before the prison. When I was at a crossroads in my life. <clears throat> so, Wildman is living in an apartment complex called Rancho Marietta, and it's a massive complex, and we've got various apartments doing stuff for us, or holding shit or selling shit, you know. And um, we're having... I got a call one day at the office. So there's this apartment owned by a guy called Fish and he's selling for me. And Fish says, can you grab Wildman and Seth? We've got a situation. I said, yeah, I'll get him. But what is the situation? He says, I'd rather not say on the phone. I said, yeah, I'll grab him and come up, come right over. So I go looking for Wildman. He's with Seth and they're collecting debts for this Colombian guy, crack debts in Central Phoenix. So I can't find them. So this has took a bit of time. It's, it's about an hour now by the time I get to Fish because Fish is in a suburb called Tempe, which is quite a drive from Central Phoenix. When I get there, he answers the door and his girlfriend's crying. I'm thinking, oh, shit, someone's tried to do something to her and they obviously want Wild Man to beat this guy up. And I'm like, what's up? And they're just stirring at me and she's crying intensively. I think, what's up, what's up? And then I hear this noise. Zzz, coming from the other room and I'm like what was that and they're like you best, best go look so I walk into this room now through Wildman opening the door into the world of real gangsters I'd met some people and one of them was this older Mexican American guy with like stately swept back silver hair skinny tall um, confident guy and I walk into this room and I'll never forget it because it haunted me for days afterwards. So there's a naked, hogtied man on the carpet with a rockabilly quiff. There's a group of Mexicans standing over him with cattle prods. And the guy with the silver hair is giving orders in Spanish. And as he gives the order, they electrocute the guy. He goes like this, like a rocking horse. He's gagged, but his eyes are bulging out of his head. And as they're electrocuting him, piss is squirting out of his dick. And I'm thinking... I've never seen anything like this before in my life. I'm I'm terrified. So my mindset is I can't show fear in this situation because then they're going to view me as a liability. The guy with the silver hair is looking at me like, well, welcome to the family smile. So I say to him, it looks like you guys have got everything under control. I'll update wild man on what's going on. I've got to get back to work. <laughs> and, the, and, and the, you know, the guy's like, yeah, you know, like blah, blah, blah. So I, I, leave, I managed to get out of that room after I've just hung out for a little bit. And on the way out, I'm talking to Fish and his girlfriend. I'm like, what has happened here? And Fish said, well, you know, like I'm dealing for you, E. I'm also dealing for them, you know, the green and the white. And um, that guy on the floor is one of my customers and he came here and he did a purchase and thought I wasn't here and came back and robbed the place and we caught him. And he robbed your stuff. He robbed their stuff. I called you. I called them. And they got here first. So the conclusion was, I mean, on the way back to the office, I was haunted, but wondering what, what happened to the guy. But the conclusion was they called his roommate and said, look, we want 10,000 or he's getting taken out to the desert. And the 10,000 was paid. But those guys, when they did finally get arrested, I didn't know who they were until they got arrested. I was doing business with them for a couple of years. The night they got arrested, it was it was the fact that I got in with them was because we protected one of their brothers. One of their brothers was on the run from the cops one night. He'd walked into an apartment party. I'm sorry, a cop had walked into an apartment party where I was talking to this guy called G-Dog. 
and the cop had smelt weed from outside. And he said to everybody, I smell marijuana from outside. Nobody move. And he went to grab his radio and G-Dog puts a gun to the cop's head and says, the only one who's not leaving is you, motherfucker. And we all just ran off into the night. So I end up in Fishy's apartment, Fish again. <laughs> we're in there, and we're like, we need to flush our stuff right now because the cops are going to be everywhere. And we're discussing that. Next thing, bang, 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 bang on the French window. It's this guy, G-Dog, had pulled a gun on the cop. And he's like, let me in. And he's like, turn the lights off, turn the TV off. They can't get a warrant that fast to come in. If they knock on the door, don't answer. And that's exactly what we did. We, we've, we thought, right, they to- we're all totally going to jail right now. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but they knocked and they went knocked next door and they left. There was a presence. I said to him, because you're hot here, I've got a house in Phoenix. Let's go over there and do some lines of meth and shoot some pool. And that's what we did. And then at the end of that night, he said, look, because your people took care of me, me and my brothers have got your back. And then three months later, he says, one of my brothers wants to meet you. So I go over to the house and there's all these low rider showcase cars on the street outside. His brother answers the door, short, bald guy, and he's looking at me like mean face and very suspicious of me because I totally didn't fit with these people. And he's like, here's my accent. And then he, he, he lightened up. He's like, damn, you talk funny. Come in and meet my homies. I'm going dry in the mouth all a second. I go into the living room. And there's all these massive Mexican-American guys with wife beater vests on, prison tattoos, chains, Khaki. shorts over sure. the knees, looking at me like they want to eat me. Like, what is he doing here? One of them shoves a spoonful of white in my face. It's not this. And that guy was a hitman who was on a killing spree. Wild man ended up in the jail with him, putting him some work for him. We found out his backstory. So I snorted the white. And um, I'm looking around the room and they had the biggest TV I've ever seen in my life. They got another TV showing all the comings and goings on the street. And then I do a double take because on top of the TV, they got a ro- um, a rocket, an RPG on the TV, like out of a Rambo movie. What the fuck? Yeah. It was, you must have been like, there must have been a lot of paranoia during these times, like, interacting with these people i'll tell you what whenever i went in the house i was in and out i would sit there thinking this is a bad vibe because something could happen and as things deteriorated for that click a lot of people were never seen again and um, when the night they got arrested all the mugshots were headline news and it said this is the new mexican mafia in arizona these are the heads of it This is the most violent, dangerous criminal organization in Arizona at this time. They're assassinating witnesses. They try to assassinate judges, cops, and even try to assassinate the head of the Department of Corrections, the Arizona prison system. Wow. Yeah. Well, I'm sure you came across a lot, a lot, a lot more Mexicans when you went over the wall. How did that happen? What what happened? How did you get into prison? So May 16, 2002, I'd quit the importation. I'd had advice from uh, the Better Call Saul woman, lawyer, <laughs> that the DEA were on to me. I met a woman and she was scared of my mates and said, if you love me, you know, we'll get a place and not let people know where we live. And, uh, ch- you know, no more importation. And I'd done all that. And I was in college studying Spanish, which came in handy later on. <laughs> and um, bam, 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 bam. So I jumped off the computer, looked through the people, it's blacked out. Tempe Police Department, we've got a warrant, open the door. I'm thinking, is it really the cops or people pretending who've found out who, where I am and have come to rob me? So I look through the window and the whole complex is surrounded, man. And I go through to the bedroom to my girlfriend, like, all right, we better let him in. And then we're walking through the living room and just bam, door just flies off the hinges, bangs against the wall. And have you ever been swatted? No, I haven't been swatted, thank you. They come in, right, so fast, and they've got these visas on, and you just see their eyes, and you know... Fuming. You know, if you make one mistake, your life's over like that. And they're screaming, get on the ground now, don't effing move now. So you just drop real fast, but that few seconds before you drop seems like a lifetime. Yeah, and then the detective, he hoists me up. He's like, English, Sean, you're a big name for the rave scene and we finally got you. 
Is that what he called you? Yeah, yeah. And he's apparently he's been interviewed for the first time and he's going to be in this documentary we've got coming up with Sammy the Bull. No way. Yeah. And they've interviewed wow. people who work for me who've never spoke before and all kinds of stuff. And they've interviewed Sammy and all his family. I said to my mom, a camera crew's coming from America to film. And um, she fought like, you know, previously like two or three people, four people at the most. There were so many vehicles. It was like 20 of them. Traffic was stopped outside the street. Um, and they took my parents to all these locations. They filmed me at Wildman's grave and all this stuff. Yeah, it's going to be massive. Well, this is a big American production. Big think. American production, And if you want yeah. to do it today. It's like 20 of them, trucks, equipment, everything. The traffic was had to be stopped on the streets of Witness for all this filming. <laughs> Oh, I can't wait to hear it. I can't wait to watch yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because there's been lots of talks over the years of Sammy the Bull and you, and yeah. people would say, oh, they don't know him, but this is good, like, you know. My enemies <laughs> clickbaited Sammy saying, I, I think what they must have done was said, yeah, there's, you've got this media guy in England saying um, he did this and that and he's met you and all this stuff. I've never ever said I've met Sammy the Bull. So Sammy the Bull's like, I've never met this English guy, blah, blah. So they used that as clickbait to say I'd made this whole story up. But let me give you the background on Sammy the Bull's ecstasy ring, right? It wasn't really his ecstasy ring. It was his, his son was brought in. So our competition over time, we had the locals locked down for a long time. But all of a sudden, these steroid head jock characters started to show up selling pills when you say jock were they american though yeah jocks like football american football players <laughs> have you meant scottish work, yeah, working yeah. out jock straps yeah so. yeah those guys we're like who are these guys stepping on our toes and um the guy running the ring was a guy called mike papa they were associated with a group called the devil dogs who would these jocks who would beat people up and bark like dogs like while they beat people up but bit, bit right wingers Anyway, that, that was who was our competition. Sammy the Bull Gravano ends up in witness protection in Tempe, Arizona. He says, I'm not going on some farm in Montana with a fake ass beard, not, you know, when people not seeing who I am. If they come for me, they may come for me and get me, but I've got a few surprises for him. So he's, he's, you know, in Arizona. And um, Mike Papa brings Gerard Gravano in to his ecstasy ring and Karen Gravano. So the kids then are running it with Mike Papa at the street level. The dad, Sammy, is advising them and investing in it. And the evidence used against him was his son said, look, I need some money for gas. And the dad said, yeah, I'll give you this much money for gas. And that was the dad investing in the ecstasy ring. So they used that as evidence against wow. him. So Sammy didn't really know what was going on at the street level of all us running around. Um, That's Gerard crazy. and Gerard, Gerard, the, the guards, well, in our first year of incarceration, because it was headline, it was in the news over there, about these two ecstasy rings competing. The guards shackled Gerard to Wildman to see what would happen. And while man's looking at me like, do you want me to do him in? And I'm like, no. I said, um, they got arrested before us. Let's talk to him about his case and see what the prosecutors are doing to him and all the tricks and pump him for information. So we spent a night with Gerard because they wake you up the night before to go court the next day. We spent a night with him and he was telling us his case. And he was quite strong as well. He was like a champion arm wrestler in the jail. <laughs> <laughs> That's crazy. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, we won't maybe go too deep into it because you've got so much content out there about your time in prison, but we do have to ask, you know. Yeah, like, yeah. What, 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 was, what was that experience? How can you describe it in a few words, maybe? Oh, a few words, man. I've got written, Hard Time is one book about just the first 26 months. Prison Time is the balance. This is tricky. Let me just try and give you a couple of stories then. <laughs> Yeah. Just to, just to uh, encompass. The, the worst is when you first go in or you get moved. The tension is the highest. And we ended up in the Maricopa County Jail System, which was run by a famous sheriff called Sheriff Joe Pyre, prides himself on being America's toughest sheriff. It's also the jail system's got the highest rate of death in the whole of the country. Yeah. No, that, what's it called, sorry? The Maricopa County Jail System. And that's in Arizona. Yeah? Yes, Phoenix. Uh, and it's got the highest rate of death. This is something that National Geographic put on the screen of my Banged Up Abroad episode. 57 people died in there around the time I was there over wow. five years, I think. Uh, they, those people are not just people getting murdered by the, uh, the gang members. 
So yeah. I had a video on my channel that I had to take down. It's it's Arian brother, Peter Van Winkle. Going with long hair? No, no, no. I, I think he's got shorter. Peter Van Winkle murdering another guy who's refused to beat someone up for the gang for the Aryan Brotherhood. And the, the method he kills him is he's doing it right in front of the security camera. Smash, smash, smash. And he's doing this for like 10 minutes. And he's looking. With what? With his. With his head into the concrete. And he's looking at the camera and he can't understand why they're not coming. He's just for 10 minutes. So then he just stands up and just starts stomping on his head for another 10 minutes. And then the guy's dead. And he's looking at the camera and they're still not coming. So he grabs the body, brings it out in front of the camera. He's on the upper tier, tries to throw it off the tier and it gets stuck on the rail and he starts kicking it over and over again until the guards come in and put him down. This is how much control the gangs have got in this prison over versus the guards. But the guards are murdering people as well. People can Google Scott Norberg, Brian Crenshaw. They murdered a blind prisoner because he couldn't produce his ID. People, these, these can be Googled. Wow. Yeah, they, they murdered multiple mentally ill people. Have you spoken people. to that Peter Van Winkle? He's on death row. He got sentenced to death because he did it in front of the camera. Okay. Yeah. I thought you said you interviewed him. No, Sorry. no. We, we, had, we had the video footage of him murdering this guy on our channel because the news, the, the, the family members sued the court through the court to get it and the news released it and we click, clipped it over to the channel. When, when you do something like that, do you, do you get like a, a strike for that? Yes, you do. So that's why we had to take it down. <laughs> and showing real world violence. I mean, YouTube was really like freewheeling at one point, but now the community guidelines get tightened every month. And if you show real world violence on YouTube, it is now a, a major strike. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so so your first, so the first couple of months was probably the hardest you First say, couple of days. First couple of days, yeah. Yeah, they, get... they split, separated me from Wild Man and put a do not house together because they did not want us conspiring and doing stuff. We'd, we'd, when the Italian Mafia took over later on, they allowed, they had the guards bring Wild Man to my building and let him spend the day with us and then take Wild Man back to his building. Really? Yeah, because there was a point, it was one of the best parts of hard time is when, the Italian mafia take over running the white race. And they, they said the head of the Italian is in this cell and they got a sign up and it's called Little Italy. We're all locked down at night and the head is outside smoking with the guards, giving them orders. They put co-defendants in my cell with me. The guards would just bring them. They'd be like, Sean, who do you want in your cell with you? Oh, this guy and this guy. And they put them in my cell with me. And um, yeah, when you say Italian mafia, like uh, a, a, just Italian mafia outfits from Arizona, or are these any like from New York or Philadelphia? Like, yeah, you... they've all got that good fellas accent, <laughs> but they've spread out across the country because yeah. there's a lot of money in Arizona and California to be had. Yeah, of course. Other scams, Nevada, Arizona. I've interviewed one of them since. He's, he's a guy called Bruno. He saw my Banged Up Abroad episode in America about four years ago and got in touch. Yeah. And I've interviewed him five times on my Have channel. Have you seen it? It seems like it's kicking up a, a bit more again. I've tell you someone I speak to who I think you should get on is Gene yeah. Borello. Oh, Gene Borello. And um, he, he done the, he used to, he was the first mafia podcast with John A. Light, the yeah. bald fella. Yeah. He's doing the rounds. Um, and you know who's now got a podcast? Joey Molino. Okay. Skinny Joe, Joey Molino. So yeah. his father was Chucky, who was the head of, he was the underboss of the Philly mob with Nicky Scarfo. Yeah. They, they, they're out there doing podcasts now. And, and Gene would do it as well. Like I've spoken to him. Yeah. He'd be great on your show. Yeah. You could, you could speak about those. You'd come with those questions about the prisons and, and different areas. Cause you know that, don't you? You know? Well, yeah, I knew a few of them. I mean, a guy became a major influence in my life. A guy called two Tonys. So I got in a situation where I've been attacked by a guy and my new cellmate, introduced me to a guy who knew if I got under his good graces, um, this guy would look out for me. And he said, have a game of chess with my mate, basically. And I said, well, what's he in for? And he's a multiple homicide. He's doing 144 years, left the dead bodies of rival gangsters from Arizona to Alaska. But he's old school Italian mafia. Don't sweat it. He's a cool dude. And I'm thinking, hold on a minute. If I beat him at chess, am I going to be next? Before I could say anything, he grabbed two Tonys from the upstairs tier and two Tonys come down the stairs like Uncle Junior. 
And I played chess with him and I beat him quite fast. He was speaking his mind throughout the game. And at the end of the game, he says, um, you know, how come you, you, you beat me like that? And I said, because you were speaking your mind throughout the game. And he slaps his head and goes, oh, me and my big mouth. <laughs> I didn't know he was testing me to see if I was an honest guy. Because my cellmate had told him that I was doing a blog. Because this is when the blog had started. It was getting smuggled out. It had been in the BBC and, and that and uh, The Guardian. Is that, what, is that really what, how, what happened? Is I'll it? give you the history of that in a second. So to Tony said to me, he was looking for someone to write his life story. And he said to me, Sean, I think you're an honest guy. To, to be, stay alive on the road of life, if I had to be a quick judge of character, would you be willing to write my life story? And I said, I would be honored. And for years, I was in his cell. He had people watching for the guards coming and shit like that, writing down his life story. Um, and when I said goodbye to him at the fence, when I was getting released, he had tears in his eyes. And he was like, Sean, I want you to know, you, you, you've been the son that I've never had. And I'm not very good at saying goodbyes. And he walked away. And I was, I walked away crying as well. I feel sad now talking about it because he died in 2010 from liver cancer, from his own drug taking. But the spirit of him lives on because his book did go out. It's called um, The Mafia Philosopher, Two Tonys. It got released, yeah. You meet some, it's fascinating, isn't it? You meet some great people in prison, don't you? Wow, it's extreme out there, uh, particularly um, Arizona. Americans just take everything to extremes, Cullen. Uh, extremes of violence, the, you know, the, the, the prison. I think 60 Minutes did a documentary about Arizona saying, it was like the most dangerous hundred square yards in the whole of the country. Before I got there, before the cameras and everything, proper like 70s, 80s prison, I spoke to people who were still alive from those years. Um, there was situations of people getting beheaded and they'd put the heads around the prison to show the other gangs they were the most violent and ruthless gangs. There was gang rapes going on. I spoke to a prisoner who was gang raped and that prisoner said that um, basically this is a trans person, right? And she wasn't a trans person when she came in. It was decades before. This is brutal. Um, disclaimer, viewers. Got to cur phrase this carefully. When this person first came into prison, she clicked up. I'm going to say she because she was trans. She clicked up with the AB, the Aaron Brotherhood. It's blood in, blood out. And they used people up and they brutalized them. And she got gang raped multiple times. And I said, well, what happened? The first time, you know, was a gang rape. They beat me up, beat me unconscious and shoved things inside my body. I said, well, what did they shove inside your body? A broomstick. I said, well, if you were unconscious, how do you know this was happening? And she said, when I went to the toilet afterwards, I could tell by what came out. And I said, well, what did you do after getting raped? And she said, well, you can't go to the guards because then you're a snitch and they put you in a dungeon for years for your own protection. You can do absolutely nothing. Um, the victim is labeled a rat, a punk, and considered less than human. And she started crying, actually, because we were writing a blog to raise awareness of prison rape. This was back in about 2005, I think, 2006. Well, she came back the next day to finish the story, which gets even worse. And I said to her, um, how did you stop this? And she said, I took the abuse for as long as I could. But in the end, they had to start fighting back. And once they saw that I didn't care if I lived or died, they stopped. You have to be ruthless. Now, she's not told me the truth. And I pumped that information out of other prisoners who trusted me. And what had happened was Xena, a lot of these, the trans, they study anatomy. And I'll, I'll get to the reason why that is um, in, a, in a minute. So Zena was studying anatomy and she came up with an idea. And the next two times the gang members came to rape Zena, Zena plucked the eyeball out so it was dangling on the optic nerve. After doing that twice, she was classified as an extremely dangerous homosexual and left alone. Because this psychopath, uh, I mentioned had been attacked. The psychopath cellmate I had told me a lot of this. He got one of his mates to attack me to get rid of me because he didn't like me because I was a fish, a fresh prisoner. So anyway, she she hadn't told me the truth. She told me about uh, pulling the eyeballs out. And to me, that was so extreme at the time. I didn't think it was possible. But I have...
since. I got, um, I ended up clicking up with a martial arts guy in prison. He told me to join a dojo when I got out. And when I joined the dojo, there's this thing called bird beak strike where you, where it comes out. And anyone who does that is going to go to prison no matter what the circumstances <laughs> because it's extreme force. So don't be trying this at home, folks. Um, so what it does, the eyeball, the, the fluid that's coating the brain could come through and it, it, you, you could die or the eyeball can go back in. It most commonly does go back in, but your sight can be impaired or you can have brain damage. There's a range of things that can happen to you. It's, it's a huge risk to come near someone who's going to do that to you. So they left her alone but moved on to some other vulnerable people. Now, one of them, they gang-raped him stuck a light bulb in his backside and took bets on who could smash it first. And that person committed suicide afterwards. Another one was gang raped and then they got a shovel from the work crew and they held him down and cut his head off. And that was one of the situations where they positioned his head in an area of the prison where the rival gangs would see it to show they were the most violent. And that was the AB. Yeah. So you would say the Alien Brotherhood are probably one of the most violent or are the most violent? Oddly enough... During my talks to the schools, which began in 2000, um, I was released 2007, 2008, 2009, I started them. I've had a PowerPoint that I showed them of the leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood. It's a very famous photo from a National Geographic documentary. One of them is Michael Thompson. And he got released about three years ago. He'd done 45 years. So the guy I'm on about with the long hair. Yeah, 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 yeah. I've interviewed him multiple times. They were given a minute to fight to the death before the guards opened up on them with fatal gunshots. And they had to grow their muscles to be huge so they would absorb the bullets so they had extra seconds for these fights to the death, these knife fights. This is the 1980s, 70s prison systems, man. It was just barbaric in California and Arizona. And the AB were major players in both those prison systems and, and still are. I mean, they're one of the major reasons for murder across the entire country right now. What was the, your time there? What was the worst thing you witnessed? Would you witnessed? Say? Yeah. Um, well, let's give the two. Let's give the worst thing, the probably the circumstance you was under, maybe yeah. pressure or violence. Yeah. And then <clears throat> what you witnessed. All right, so I mentioned that the prosecutor put my uh, sentence down to 34 years on the paper to the prison system. So I was fast-tracked to Supermax for about three or four months, which is, is a completely different world. But once my sentence had been fixed and I got moved to medium security, I was hoping they would be softer, but the guards played a prank on me and put me in with a serial home invader torturer. So when I arrived at this cell, um, in America, like, you've got your bed in rolled up in a mattress when you're going into your cell. And I put it on the top bunk where he had his artwork laid out and he snapped right away. And he was like, I've got a padlock in a sock. I could smash your head while, while you and kill you whenever I want fish. Because <clears throat> uh, a fish is a new prisoner. He was fresh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And um, I'm thinking, look, I'm a quiet guy. I just read and write, you know, trying to talk him down. But he, he was just off his rocker on, on meth and heroin and doing his thing. So he schemed to get rid of me. What happened was my parents were flying 5,000 miles to visit me for Christmas. And someone told me early on, you know, prisons like high school mentality with deadly consequences. And I'm, I'm blessed because I never got any teeth knocked out. I never got any bones broken or anything like that. So I'm walking to the visit to see mum and dad happy as can be. They come 5,000 miles. And he, my a home, serial home invader torture cellmate, he's got his mate, this big biker gang member guy to attack me just to spoil all this and, and hopefully get rid of me out of his cell. So this big guy comes up behind me, you know, just starts kidney punching me. And I turn around and everyone stops to look because when I mentioned about going into the jail in the very beginning, they tell you right away, there's the rules. So if someone hits you or calls you a punk or calls you a bitch, you've got to fight them on the spot or else your whole race is going to attack you. You must take showers or they're going to smash you for bad hygiene. Can't go make offense with the guys, they're going to smash you for snitching. Can't sit with the other races and so on and so on. So everyone's looking at me like, what's this guy going to do? I start throwing some kicks and, punch, from kicks and punches. 
it's like hitting a big bag of cement. <laughs> so this isn't working out very well for me, but at least I'm trying. <laughs> That's, you got to show heart. That's the rule. Yeah. Sure. Um, anyway, he smashes me up, knocks me down. And I'm, I'm injured by this point, you know, in, in the back and stuff. And someone shouted, what is it? One time they shout one time, which means a guard's coming. So he stopped at that point and he, he got rid of himself. So I go to the visit. Mum's had a nervous breakdown over my, my situation. She sees I'm injured. I can't tell her what's happened. But um, that was that was, uh, that was was a situation. And like I said, my, my new cellmate, when I got moved out of that cell, um, he introduced me to Tony's and I was all good after that. But the guy that, that schemed this, who used the other guys, his cat's paw, he was throwing batteries at me for a couple of weeks from the upper tier. And that's why my cellmate says, what's going on with this guy? And I told him the whole story. And then I met two Tonys and it was all good. Because there was another situation later on where I wrote a blog about how the prisoners were making homemade syringes from items you could get from the inmate store. And a shot caller on another yard, AB again, put out a green light to have me attacked or killed for putting those secrets out there. And then... Well, that is, I'm not going to lie. That right? is a that stupid is, thing. It's a yeah. risky thing you're doing. It was doing. a thing, yeah. It was a stupid you thing. You know, thing. obviously you're thinking, oh, so it's going to the UK, so it's probably, oh, it's YouTube, but, you know, I'm... So it was, it was, uh, it was, blog, know, it was just they, a they blog. Would, they would say, he's self-snitching he's self yeah, on us, exactly. man. And that's what they would say. But that's what they said. That's mad. Yeah. Yeah, yeah what, what would you put down to why you didn't, why you survived? You didn't um, join a gang, so what was it? First off, the reason I did that blog was because my cellmate who introduced me to Tony's and protected me, he co-signed basically saying it was a good idea to do that blog. So that's, yeah, all right. Anyway, I don't know if you know, it was accessible, but, but I'm sorry to answer your question then. Wild Man is a very good guy to get arrested with. When the Italian mafia were asking me who I wanted as my cellmates, they put in a guy, one of my co-defendants called Joey Crack, Joey Crack was a six foot something guy, skinny as hell from all of his drug abuse, had the face of an Afghan hound, and he was a walking drug testing kit. If we, if someone was doing a deal and he was there, he'd just put it in a needle, and put it in his neck and be like, yeah. <laughs> and he talked a lot. So every night he's telling the Italian mafias these stories of him on the streets with Wildman, all the shit they got up to. So the Italians are like, we need to meet this guy. And then we arranged for them to meet him on the back row of Catholic mass. I don't know if you want that story, but it's a big, long story. But my point here is the whole jail pretty much very quickly knew who Wildman was. And I was with him for my first year. And that enabled me to establish certain relationships that played out later on. So that's the bottom line answer to your question. Yeah. No, and when I, Two Tonys I, I, took me under his wing that. as well, Two Tonys had the respect of all the races. So in Arizona, it's the whites, the AB, it's the blacks, the Mau Mau, it's the Mexicans. I feel like the Italians kind of transcend into all, like, you know, they don't get bothered as much. Would you say? Well, it didn't work out well for the guy who was out giving the orders to the guards to move my cellmates in and stuff like that. Really? Yeah, that's a very sad story that he's doing life right now. Um, Bruno, the guy I've interviewed, who was the enforcer for Little Italy in the jail I was at, okay. who saw my banged up and contacted me, and he's done, we've done a lot of stories together. He said, yeah, they love Wild Man. He was a maniac, but much love and respect. Um, he updated me on the head. And what happened was, um, he's, he's, he's got done for a double, a double homicide conspiracy and he's serving the rest of his life in prison. But also, there was a day in the Towers Jail when the Italians were running it that they all said, look, let's go Muslim services which goes against all the rules of the Aryan Brotherhood. And we're like, yeah, he's like, yeah, come on, we'll just, we'll meet the Imam, we'll have a laugh. Nothing like this had ever been done before. It was just like, cause we were so bored, basically. He was just finding a fun thing for us to do for the day. So we're in a 45 man pod. And when they announce something, it's the first to line up at the door, get to go. But because he was running the guards, the guards would tell him what was coming and we'd all line up at the door. So we're all lined up at the door. We've got all these white guys lined up for Muslim services. The guards are like other guards now in other towers are thinking they're going to riot. So the whole jail now is, is on red alert. But they allowed us to go because he talked them. This guy could talk his way from anything. So we go and we meet the imam and we have a good time. And we're, you know, we're fascinated. They're teaching us about that culture. 
and every everyone's getting along. It, it, it was a great, it was it was a fun thing to do for us. We're locked in here. We're bored out of our minds, and we come back. Now, there was only a few of them, and the Aryan Brotherhood were ever present ever, everywhere, and they ran everything. And if this was a brief moment in time when they got control of it, and it, it never happened again. So what happened was, um, when the head got moved on, um, the Nazis took over again. I mean, these guys had Hitler all over them. One of them had Hitler, Zeke Heiling over a, a gas chamber with Jewish people dying inside of it, things like that. And we got moved, they moved us all, and they moved us to a new building, and we were all interrogated by the AB guys. Who went to, did, are you, hey, Wood, you a solid Wood? Well, did you go to Muslim services? We're like, nope, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. Anyway, it caught up with him later on. We think he had situ he had situations over it. Yeah. Fuck you know. Yeah. Oh, for that bit of a... Uh... Yeah. I'll give you another story on, on, the, on the racism if you want. Yeah. I was in, oh, the, I was in, um... <laughs> I was in the, the day room early on in my first year and there was a, a La Victoria gang member out of Tempe, a Chicana, which is a Mexican-American called Sniper. There's no weights or anything because all that would get weaponized. People's skulls would be smashed in. So we're doing like dips. There's, there's these octagonal silver tables bolted to the floor with chairs bolted. We're doing the dips, the push-ups. Under the stairs, we've got, we've wrapped our pink socks so we can do our pull-ups and stuff. So I'm doing this workout with Sniper. And then the AB guys are like, they, cut, they creep up to the door and I see them staring at me. And they're like, want a word with your word? And Sniper's like, go talk to your people. Yeah, go talk to your people. So they get me in the cell again, like they did at the very beginning when they laid down the rules. And they're like, take a look around the day room, Wood. And I look around, look around the day room. Do you see any white boys working out with the other races? Nope. <laughs> Got a lot to learn, Wood. Now go and finish your workout. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking hell. Have you, have you watched American History X? Yeah. It's like that. It's pure fanatical. Yeah. They could just swaz it out and everything all over them. But most of the violence is within, the own ra is within their own races. The people are getting killed are them killing themselves. And, uh, you know, I interviewed another AB recently. It's become the biggest thing in, in recent months. Casper. He, he's the, and also on that photo, those, those guys have been showing to the kids for years. The second one just got out as well. He's done 40 years. And he, he's saying it's, they, they eat themselves. They cannibalize themselves. Uh, it's like the mafia. They only kill their own, you know. You violate. Your mates are going to take you to the basement. Bam, bam. You're out the loop. Yeah. Wow. The pro absolute priority of all the gangs is to keep the drugs <laughs> businesses running. So if there are interracial conflicts, the heads of each race sit down, and if two guys have got a beef, they say, you guys go in the cell under the stairs, have a fight, squash the beef, have a hug and a smoke after, and don't mention it again. Because if people start jumping in from both races and it escalates to a riot, which there was a riot story, which is a big, long story, the drugs business gets stopped because the whole jail gets locked down for several days and there's no visits. So they tell you right away, all the beefs are squashed man on man. Wow. Interesting stuff. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. So you finally get out. Yeah. Um, so you, it, it, it was Connie first, obviously. Yeah. Did you come to a British jail then? No, I had served my sentence. So they put me on a normal flight from LA and They've um, took me to this airplane and the guard takes me to the stairs where there's the cabin crew. He says, we're going to put you on first so you don't scare the passengers. And the cabin crew just talked to me like I was a person. And my wow. heart was melting. It was beautiful. It was a beautiful thing, man. <laughs> imagine how happy imagine, you are yeah, to be yeah. talked to like you're a person. You take it to... So I get on the plane, they seat me, and I made a few mistakes. All the women are getting on. Like, I've been living with sweaty, hurry men for six years, and I can smell the women and the perfume, and, and it's, it's like my senses are being triggered. But my mistake was I put I put my hand up and asked a female Miss. member of the cabin crew, can I go on the toilet? Where's the toilet? Am I okay to go to the toilet? Because it's a bit institutionalized. Because yeah. when you're in transportation, you have to ask permission to go to the toilet. 
Um, so she's laughing at me, you know, you don't need to ask. It's right there. What it was, I was thinking, I was conscious that with these women out there was smelling me that I was thinking I was really paranoid because I'd been in transport for days and I hadn't had a shower and I wanted to have a bird bath in, in where the toilet was. So I did that and came back. A bird bath? Yeah, in prison. There was a lot of lockdowns, man. Short staffs or riots oh, so or fights. Watching the thing, you yeah, so your bird bath, you've got your combination sinks. There's a little sink there. You press a button and some water dribbles out of yeah, your toilet. <laughs> so, you you know, you just soap up your pits and your groin and yeah. that's your bird bath. Yeah, yeah so I, was doing, I did one of them. And um, then the flight, I was so excited. I hadn't slept in days. And there's, there's footage as well. I'll give you permission to use it if you want to authenticate what I'm saying. But I look bugged out like crazy when I'm hugging my mum and dad. They're crying. My sister on the drive away, my sister busts out a phone and ex explains me what texting is. But you can see on my face, I've been through some things. Yeah. Wow. Did you at that point know what you was going to do with your future? No. I mean, I had... Um, I was a bit confused, to be honest. I was a confused person. I had educated myself to the fullest ability while I was in prison by reading a lot of books. And I was con contemplating going back to university to do a master's degree. And I think I did reach out to them, but they wouldn't allow me to do it. It was in English because I didn't have an English A-level or something. Um, so I was on the dole for a year. And um, the dole... Well, I was, I was under threat from the mental health team, let's put it that way, because they asked me if I'd take a medication... And I said, when I was in max security and I was living with the cockroaches for a year and I couldn't sleep because they were crawling all over me, um, they did give me medication to get to sleep. And they said, when you think that you don't need your medication, that's grandiosity, you're bipolar and we need to double your medication. And I said, but, <laughs> but I'm, I'm not in prison anymore. I don't feel like I need medication. So they were threatening blood tests, home visits, and... Wild man got out and he said to the same mental health team, I've got red dots in my head telling me to hurt people. I need help. And they said to him, you're just making that up so you can get more benefits. Isn't it crazy? The hypocrisy <laughs> and the, the total shift is similar with them. Um, social services. You know, some people might literally not have anything wrong with the kids or, you know, yeah. People will refer people in and they will have their kids taken off them like that. And then there's families out there who will self-refer because they probably just can't handle it or they just need a bit of help. And they will go, oh, no, because you self-referred, you don't need the help. It's just backwards. It's man. all upside down. So basically, I was on the dole living with my mum and dad. They have got an extension on the garage. <laughs> and um, what happened was I won a short story contest my mum had entered me into through prisoners abroad when I was still in prison. And I was depressed and everything. They were trying to send me to telly sales jobs. <laughs> and um, these wonderful people called the Kersler Trust who help prisoners rehabilitate through arts. I've heard of them. Contacted me and said, you've won this competition. Will you come to the Royal Festival Hall and read your story? So I went down there and I explained my predicament. And they said, look, we've got a mentorship scheme where we have a published author mentor someone who's been in prison and help you try and get published. Because they asked me what my goal was in life. And I said, I, I, want, I want to get this book published. So this wonderful woman, Sally, came from Scotland. And we met every uh, month. And um, <laughs> with her mentorship, uh, I managed to get a literary agent and get the book published. But after the year on the dole at my mum's, there was still a lot to go. I moved to one of my best mate's houses. He was a former ex player of mine. He's a lad out of Manchester, but he moved to LA. He was a DJ, Mike Hot Wheels. Shout out to him. God bless him. I ended up, after living in with my parents, I ended up living in a bedroom at his house for 10 years. And even when the book come out, people think, you got a book, you're going to be Harry Potter, make all this money. I was still on the dole for years and years and years yeah. after my book came out. Yeah, that's uh, the perception again, isn't it? Well, I sat in his bedroom for 10 years, building up my socials. I was, I'd get my breakfast and get to my computer. And I was still on my computer by the time I was going to bed. So, I only have, when I left the room to go to gym. But when you say building up your socials, yeah. like in what sense, like what would you do? So I was writing my books. Mm. I was sharing my blog posts. Okay. I was doing YouTube videos. And um, just 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 slow and steady progress. And and it, and it was, a, you know, it was a struggle for... 10 quite, years. I was, I was almost on the door for ten, almost 10 years. See, uh, th that, that gives 
even myself, like hope and inspiration that like, you know, yeah. it, it isn't that like, you know, people do blow up and go viral and instant hits like, but for the majority of us, that isn't the case. And it's just about pushing it, isn't it really? Colin, people see me viral and just think I've just got lucky overnight. They don't know the backstory. You've got to sweat blood in anything. Everything I've done, whether it's legal or illegal, being an author, being a YouTuber, or being a stock market guy, they've all took five to 10 years before you start to see any results and 10 years before you, you're going to get in the upper tier. Yeah. I, I, I was going to say it in the intro, but I haven't now, actually. But um, mm -hmm. you're nearly on a million subscribers, Sean. Yeah, but how many are you on? 50,000? And you've been, yeah. doing, it, you've been yeah. doing it how long? 60? Um, two and a half years. It took me five years to get 2,000 subscribers. You're ahead of the game, man. Don't say that, man. You, you make me feel good, you man. You are. You are. Because I, I beat myself up sometimes with it, like, you know. No. I was going like a snail compared to you. I think podcasting wasn't about then, though, as much as it is now. But you are right. I know what you're saying. But, yeah, what I, what I wanted to say was, like, like how excited are you to, to get to that, that mark? Because it must be a great sense of achievement to get to that. You know, and it's been a while. I remember when you was on like five to six. I think the last few years, it's really shot up for you, hasn't it? Colin, what matters to me now is my son. I just hold him and I just melt. And like everything that's going on in that day on the phone or in emails or anything, I hold him and I'm fucking... <clears throat> Mate, honestly. <sighs> honestly, it means everything to me. It's just nothing matters. A million subs, a million subs can fuck itself. When I look, when he, he's laying there covered in shit, smiling at me, and I think I've got problems, and if he can lay there covered in shit and smile, what the fuck does anything matter in the world? Yeah, you've just you've just put you put me right in my place there <sighs> on, on perspective of life. Totally, I'm blessed. Did you ever think you was gonna have a? A child? I didn't. I didn't. I, I, How old are you, Sean? So I have a child in America, and I was running around on crystal meth, and then I went to prison, and I wasn't there for that child, and I feel sick to my stomach. Mate, I, I, I don't know. I have a child that I've never been there for, and it's a horrible feeling, isn't it? It is. And she's turned out brilliantly, and she says, look, I've turned out like this because I've got two crazy parents. Yeah. And when you've got two crazy parents, you realise you can't do the things they did. Isn't it fascinating how I've said this to all the time to people, like some of my friends who didn't have the best yeah. upbringings are actually stable, strong people. Yeah. My parents, your parents, they've done everything for us. Totally. Still together, rarity yeah. in this day and age. And we, we, we were fuckers. Yeah, totally. We, we ended up still going to fucking prison <laughs> and fucking doing all these audacious crimes, yeah. you know? And... <laughs> I think I think sometimes when you have an upbringing like that, you know, we not 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 privileged, but just lucky to have good parents. I think we 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 have to go through these things to yeah to learn yeah you know yeah. How are you going to parent Ziggy? How am I going to parent Ziggy? Yeah, when he grows up, like, are you going to be the old strict dad? You're going to be the laid back. <sighs> You're going to balance it. So I think Jen is the disciplinarian and I'm the fun guy because Jen has difficulty sometimes trying to get him to sleep and her tension transfers to Ziggy, and which makes it worse. So Ziggy's got certain rave DJs that I play on YouTube. We've got kind of big baby face guys <laughs> who I will literally stand for an hour or two Dancing with Ziggy, watching Aww. these rave guys until he falls asleep in my arms. And he also really loves Boney M. And Class. Jen's cottoned on because <laughs> I play him Daddy Cool every night. And I'm hoping he's going to say Daddy before he says Mama. Yeah, yeah. just realized. Daddy Cool. <laughs> Daddy Cool. She started playing in Mamma Mia and stuff like that. But <laughs> it's, it's not, he doesn't like it. He doesn't like it. That's he was good. crying the other night. Jen's like, what are we going to do? He's colicky, blah, blah, blah. Bam, Daddy Cool. And he, he, he was like, he went, 
Mm. Oh, I love him. And that was it. Three Boney M tracks and he was asleep. Brilliant. Yeah. He's, he's definitely a, yeah. a daddy's boy. The other thing I do is I take him out of the house. If he's crying and it's cold and it's windy, the minute that wind and cold hits him, he puts his head into my neck and he falls asleep. <sighs> he's like shielding something and he falls asleep. You, you, you obviously you know, didn't have that, that, that bond with your first child. So this is all new to you. And, and to me, like from the outside, you are in the public eye. So to me, the, the, you know, having a baby with Jen was a massive surprise yeah. to me. Yeah. So it, it must be beautiful now to, to have this little, is, this little human is, being is, in your shoulder when I mean, you probably didn't expect this yourself. It's transformed my life completely. Yeah. The whole day. It's a new way of living. Mm everything now i've got to sacrifice everything now is for him but i enjoy that yeah, yeah. enjoy that it's it's great it's I a think, great feeling i think, I think the, the the way i asked the question to you about the million subs was as if i was speaking to sean out with two years ago you know the man who was churning content out every single day ruthless yeah. with it and like you yeah. know on top of his game yeah um but I, now you know what's important in life i've done a ted talk on what facing 200 years taught me about happiness. And in that TED talk, I say that when I was facing 200 years and I was in the Max Security Jail and I was going to kill myself, I was living with the cockroaches, <laughs> feeling sorry for myself. <laughs> yeah. Um, a guy limped into my cell a couple of days later. He had a steel rod in his leg. Um, the screws were loose and the jail won't fix it. He was hurting from that. He had hepatitis C, he had syphilis, and he had stomach cancer. And he was in agony every time he went on the toilet. And uh, I, I was thinking, listen, so he's going to die in a couple of years in the jail. He told me he was limping. I, said, I was feeling so sorry for myself. I was going to kill myself the other night and listen to what this guy's going through. He's going to die in here. Being pushed to the brink of suicidal insanity month after month for 26 months with the case getting more and more serious and facing more and more time. The first couple of months, I'm missing my million dollar house on the mountain, I'm missing my plasma screen TV, I'm missing my swimming pool, jacuzzi, all that crap. Once... I got sentenced to nine and a half years. That was the happiest day of my life because I could see when I was going to get my life back. Yeah. By that point, the million dollar house on the mountain, jacuzzi, sports cars, none of that ma mattered anymore. And what I realized is happiness is your thoughts and it's in your heart and it's what you make it. And that love, when Ziggy's smiling at me, he's just so pure and innocent. That's the most powerful thing in the world. So I'm getting emotional just oh. listening to this show. Honestly, <laughs> mate. No, it's it's wonderful. How did um how did you and Jenny like come to be? Because you were partners at first, weren't yeah, you? Yeah. It was more of a She contacted me because she was running an organic cotton clothing company and asked me to start promoting her hoodies and stuff, which I did. She was in a relationship at the time. I don't know if she should be talking about this stuff. Okay. <laughs> uh, I'll say a bit, let's just say that when her relationship wasn't going so well. She would come to my flat. Confined. And we would dance to Queen, to Freddie Mercury, another one bites the dust for hours on end until she fell asleep. This is this is my thing, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, like, like... Until she fell asleep. And the next day she'd go back to her boyfriend until two or three weeks later, something abusive has happened. And I, I'd come and pick her up and we'd get Queen on. And that's how we bonded. Wow. Yeah. No one bites the dust. <laughs> That's mad. Isn't it? I, I, yeah. I, I, and uh, if you look back now, would you say you didn't even look at her like, as in like, oh, here's a girl I could hit on. Like you, it was genuine, a friend. Well, you, she, did, you might have found her beautiful. Obviously, you know, she's she, a beautiful woman. She's fit as fuck. <laughs> I was thinking um, things in my head as any man, man would. But my relationships with women, it's never been like I've aggressively pursued them. It's like I've kind of put myself in situations where I've made friends with women yeah. and things have, have evolved. evolved. And if they don't evolve, it's still that friend. It's still nice still to hang there. out with a beautiful yeah. bird. Of course it is. You're just absorbing that energy. Yeah. And it's, it just makes you feel good. Yeah. 
Yeah, because do you know what made me laugh about your show? This true crime podcast. Did you see the boots she was wearing? Yeah, yeah. In those early podcasts. Yeah, mate, the true crime podcast oh. podcaster turned fucking uh, was it Casby? Another one? All the these porn stars. I'm like fucking Eltron. The domination. Yeah, that was mad. She's a good mate of ours now. <laughs> and, um, we're I do, used to, doing, I used to masturbate over there as a kid. We're, we're doing we're doing a documentary with Kaz now. Yeah, yeah, fascinating. She, Will she, I was, be over, about the she was over. She was over a couple of weeks ago. Would that be about the industry and stuff? Yeah, or be, be the how how to become a dominatrix? Dominatrix. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's, that is mad. Yeah. Um, with other books, because I, you know, the Lee Marvin and some others. So, yeah. do you, what do you do? You help publish them? Is it? Is that what you do? Or yeah. So. You know, a lot of good people helped me when I got released, like Erwin James. Mm-hmm. And his book was an inspiration to me. He he moved to Wales. And Erwin. Erwin James, yeah. He worked at The Guardian. Yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. yeah, 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 yeah. He helped me when I first got out. Wow. And a lot of people helped me, like my mentor, like the Curse of the Trust. So I think it's my, because I do yoga and meditation, it's my karmic destiny to help other guys especially guys yeah. who've been in prison and who've, who've been through things yeah. so a third of the guys i was housed with couldn't even read all right and i understand the difficulties people may have brilliant stories yeah. but getting it down on paper but if you can speak you can dictate your story have it you know to something that will type it up and come to us if you've got it written up and we will consider it for publication if it's if it's a good story really? well, that's um, good for people to hear that so well. that's what people have done people have come to us and they've generally written their own stories. You've got people coming to us saying, will you write my story? That's a different ball game, yeah. To write your story, it would mean we would have to sweat blood for years to do that. Yeah. We're not prepared to do that. That's- Is that what Jamie Boyle does then? Is that what he does? Jamie up in the north. Yeah. Yeah, he yeah. He publishes. Is that, is that, that what that means? So, so Jamie Boyle, um, he interviews, like, all right. Then the we, we, and all that, we, We've published all of his audiobooks, most of them. Wow. Going back to the Sykes and the Duffy ones, which are really good sellers. And they're they're very fascinating stories, those guys. Um, but what Jamie Boyle does, he's a full-time author. So he'll go, if he's writing a book about Sykes, he'll interview like 20, 30 people who knew Sykes. And he'll type up those interviews and there'll be a chapter from each interview that's that's his format um but people come to us if it's their story they need to get it written up somehow for us to publish it yeah right okay yeah. interesting yes it, it, it is fascinating and and you know you just said then as well like you know help build yourself up and you know you, you people from the guardian how did how did this all come about did you just again the networking just emailing people was it is that what you Kind of done at that young... All right, so... When I was writing letters home from the Maximum Security Madison Street Jail in 2004, my family members were really responding to the conditions I was in, the food, the dead rats in the food, the cockroaches all over us at night times, the guards murdering prisoners, things like that, the gang stuff. And we were thinking... My dad had seen that there was a blog out, a guy called Salem Pax. He was in Baghdad when the bomb started falling. And this guy was able to get his voice out versus the Western media about what it was really like to be in a country that's getting bombed by America. Yeah. So we had discussions about starting a blog. Because my mum was aware of the guards murdering prisoners, she didn't want us to do it. But it was decided... Scared that it might happen to you? Yeah. But it was decided that my aunt who was visiting me would smuggle the writing out for visitation and we would put it under, not my name, we put it under John, John's Jail Journal, J-O-N-S. John is Irish for Sean. And um, they wouldn't hopefully detect who I, it was <laughs> while I was under, that, isn't, in that in that remand jail. Isn't it fascinating that you, 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 you've gone to jail for smuggling, but now you're, <laughs> you're, you're smuggling something for the right reasons, let's say, you know, inside. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. True. I, I, I changed from, you go from darkness to light, haven't you, the energy? Yeah. So all those blog entries are still standing if people want to read them or watching this. John's Jail Journal, the timestamp, documenting my journey through that jail. And that, that stuff became the genesis for hard time, was the writing the letters home to yeah. my uh, girlfriend and the, the, the blogging and all that stuff. 
Um, does that answer your question? Have we gone off on a yeah, tangent? Yeah, no, no, it does. Okay. And this is what does my head in, though, as well, like with these people who, you know, we people have mobile phones. I, I've been in jail. Yeah. I, I've used an iPhone in jail. You know, I've had, I've had a, a Zanko in jail. But you see people now and they, they, they do the most stupidest things. And it's in entertainment. People want to hear. It's fascinating. Yeah. But surely if you've got a phone in, in jail, surely you should do, you could do a podcast. Yeah. Why don't you interview someone in jail rather than, yeah. you know, just doing a video of someone fucking dancing. <laughs> or actually interview someone who could be fascinating, who will never get out. Someone who we would never be able to, unless we had the access to, yeah. uh, be able to interview. Um you know, you've got a you've got a state of the art camera there, and do a podcast with that guy. I think people should start doing that. That's a really good angle. Yeah, you know, use it for good, not just to embarrass people. Not you know, open the flap and see someone having a spice attack. You yeah. know, someone's someone's kid, like you know. And sadly, the whole day revolves around getting the drugs in. And I'm not putting those guys down because they're innocent. Because they're the ones who were victims of paedophiles, and society didn't help yeah. them. They're the ones who didn't have any parents and were put into state care. They're the ones who the parents have died, haven't been murdered, and have been just been thrown away. Yeah. So I understand the mindset, and it's a mindset of they've not been given educations. A lot of them can't read or write. A lot of them. I wouldn't say all. You know, me and you, we were drug addicts. We come from. You know, there is a there is a I would say the majority. But what I used to do is I used to dig for trauma. Like why why am I taking drugs? Like why yeah. did I become a heroin addict? I never got nonced as a kid. I never, I never got beat up as a kid, you know, yeah. and, you know, I come from a good family. Why did I become a smackhead? Mm. You know, I hate that word, but to say it to no, myself, why did I become this way? And it can be, it can be the smallest of things that, that take you on that road, you know? But then it's, that makes it even more important that it's our responsibility because we're educated to articulate those stories. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Talking about uh, podcasting and as well, I want to just dive in like briefly, maybe a bit about uh, you. You went through like a, a when I come into this world of podcasting, I was introduced to to you, uh, James English, True Jordy, these other shows, Offsprings, where like you know Billy Moore might have went on one of yours or, or James's, and then he done his podcast, and yeah, uh, and then you know this term the podcast was I oh god. What what is your take on on that? Like, what yeah. are the podcast wars? The podcast wars began when two of those guys you just mentioned went on the channel of the fellow out of Liverpool and tested the water by doing an attack on me. Now I'd been helping those both of those guys for years beforehand, and they got a lot of views and a lot of feedback that was positive from trolls I'd gathered by exposing elite pedos. So I thought, exposing these monsters, I would have the whole world rally around me. And when you go after elites who are doing those heinous things to kids, you go through hell. The trolls and the forces of evil that rise up against you yeah. and try and hack you and troll you and try and find out who your family are and contact people who you're doing business with and try and... All this was ongoing, and then these guys jumped on the bandwagon, didn't they, in a concerted attempt to try and destroy my reputation and steal my subscribers. And it did work for them in the beginning. You see, them, you noticed a decline. It worked for them in the beginning. They were getting subs. For example, when the Scottish podcaster had Darren G on, and he basically, because Darren G later showed us the messages from the Scottish podcaster saying, Atwood's got pedo charges in Arizona. He's going down. You need to get away from him. So G was wound up to come on and say everything under the sun that the Scottish podcaster didn't want to say himself. And what happened was I lost 10,000 subs within days because I had to hire a lawyer right away and file a defamation suit. So, so, I was called a pedo like dozens, if not hundreds of times during that interview, among other things. They said I was gay. They said um, I was a Jimmy Savile. Um, what was, is it oh. sort of like he, what he talks about uh, taking down pedophiles is because he's fascinated with pedophiles. Like, is this some no, of the rhetoric they, did, they, they didn't say, say that. Or? They were just straight up saying I was a certified pedo. I've got charges in Arizona. It's all coming out and he's going down. 
without any evidence to back it up whatsoever. Were they and what were they trying to say? Because because you I've heard as well, like you know, was he really a kingpin? Was it like the sense of like he, the only reason he went to jail in Arizona was for paedophilia? Is that is that what they're trying to say? Or it's more complicated than that because Darren G was just one strike they launched against me. So they also launched a strike against me through Marvin Herbert. And Marvin Herbert, I was told I was going to go interview him. He was going to interview me. He wanted me to help him publish his book. And I was tricked into a situation Whoa. with him whereby they later on just said, Atwood's only, Marvin later said, after I've met him, I can see he's not a G. I never claimed to be a G. They said, um, yeah, people need to he's, he's only done a day in jail. All of his stories are made up. Um, they put they but click they, I love Marvin like yeah, I yeah. some good, but like, like you can't you know just because you've lived the life you can't just say like I know he hasn't been in jail like yeah. how, how can you say that about someone like you know a lot of people do meet me and think I'm the boy next door and they're like how the hell has this happened how many people have we met in jail who are the boy next door though true and there's so true. many of there's so many so all this happened this concerted attack to destroy my reputation and steal my subscribers happened during the months while man was on his deathbed and I wasn't in the best frame of mind. So I did make some mistakes in responding to these people and I should have just risen above it. Um, now, what's happened since then is nearly all of them, including the ones who've got the most followers, let's just say, have called me and apologized. They've said the information they were provided. These were by my trolls who were going on the back of what we were exposing. They said the information they were provided was false. They understand that that information was false and they were they were ill advised. Now I've asked these people, I've said, look, I accept your apology, but those videos went out to two million people and I'm still receiving death threats to this day. I want a public apology. I've asked, you don't even have to do a public apology, but I would appreciate it if you if you would do one. A but post. at the very least, could you just do a video saying exactly what you've said to me? that these things you've said about me, having these charges overseas is the main one that I've got. I've had problems with. Could you just say to your followers, you made a mistake, it was based on bad information given to you, and that I'm a good guy, and that is not true. I'm a convicted ecstasy guy. My story's all over the internet. My story's been authenticated by Random House, who did all my books. It's national. I've done multiple documentaries, Vice. You, it, stuff would come out with the yeah, woodwork. Yeah, yeah. So it, if they would impossible. at least just do a video saying that, and they've not. So to me, although I accept their apology, and I would like to collaborate with these people, and I think we should all just be getting along, like we said in the beginning, it's a bit of a hollow apology that they've not advised their followers because I'm still getting attacked yeah. by these people. It's, it's more like, it, it sounds to me like it's one of those things where like, you know, to the to the mass, like it's like <clears throat> wrestling or something. Or it's like the uh, the Neil McAvoy thing about the voting against racism and, and the one politician didn't do it. And, you know, behind the scenes, you went, you know how it goes, Neil, just business. It's like as if that's what it is. You know, behind the scenes, I am sorry. Yeah. But this is business, like, you know, I can't, to a public one. That's what it seems like to me. And I'll go even one step further and I'll say this for the first time exclusively here. And that is <laughs> because I agreed with these people that if they did that, I would then retract the things I said about them. And I'll jump ahead now and retract something to you. So when James English said those things about me, which caused me the most damage, I had no idea about James English's backstory and people sent me information about him. So I went online thinking, right, if I'm getting attacked, I'm a wuss if I just sit here and take this and don't fire back and say things about them. They're just taking anything coming in about me and saying it, and I did the same. So I said things about English that it's come out aren't true. And I would like to retract that here today. And if any of my followers see this, then it wasn't true what the things I said. Wow. Well, we, I'm saying know, that in the hope he will be inspired to say the same. And if he doesn't, yeah. he's showing his true colours and his apology to me was hollow. Well, I think James English, I've never met the guy, never spoken to him uh, personally. But, you know, I, I, I don't think he's a bad person. He seems to get a lot of good people on and you know it seems like well 
you know, I don't know. I, I can't judge him personally, but, you know, I think it's a tough one, actually. I, you know, because I actually see you help people, and I don't think it's for for show either. I've seen you bring people on, and, and this is not so people. sad, man. I was helping like, English for you, years. Yeah, you collaborate a lot. He like, had ten thousand followers. He was calling me every week. I've never heard of him collaborate. Sean, you're my podcast brother. How do I do this? How do I do that? Can I send you this guest? Can I? Can you? Can you send me this guest? This was. If you go back to my early interviews with people like Stephen French, I give a shout out saying, look. After you finish this interview, go to the James English channel and watch Frenchie's interview. Yeah, I've he's, seen he's, that. I've seen that. That's how it should be. <sighs> that must have hurt you. They yeah. drew first blood, man. Yeah, that must have hurt. You know, if he's apologised, <clears throat> that's fair enough. And, and you said it publicly. I, I think it would be nice if he did say something. Because right? I'm still suffering from all these people who still think what he said was true. Because let me give you a story, right? I hosted the Michael Francis tour last time he was here. And we were in the north and a guy came up to me and he was acting a bit strange. And I started talking to him and telling him a bit about, you know, the, the tour and how it was going. And he asked me a few questions. And by the end of the conversation, he goes, Sean, you know what? I've got to be honest with you. When James English said those things about you, he was so convincing. I just totally believed him. And now I've met you here tonight. I can see you're a good guy. And he came up and gave me a hug and walked away. But there's still countless people out there. Well, I, I, I'll be honest, Sean. Like, um, you know, I, I questioned it. Yeah. Because it, it did, like, and, and it wasn't just James, was it? It was like a there few. There was a concerted, there was, yeah, there was a concerted thing to take me down. Do you think that it was, who, who did you think would, was at the bottom of it. Like, who do you think was responsible for it? Do you think it was another podcaster or do you think it was trolls informing podcasters and to them it sounded like this would be a good idea to help? All right. I kind of played a role in making things worse because when those people, you know, like we said at the beginning, if someone tells you to do something, like take something down, you, you don't do it, you keep it up. I had a few situations ongoing whereby... I had a podcast that was, they were threatening me to take down the podcast. Not the one we mentioned earlier. It's a, it's a completely different one. And then when I started to go after the elite predators, things just got crazy with the trolls. Yeah. And um, I started messing with them. I was messing with them, thinking I've got this under control because these trolls don't have any followers. They're just yeah. doing these wicked little things. Yeah, <laughs> but, 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 James English took what they were doing and broadcast things to 2 million people. Mm. And that created havoc at that point. And that's why we had to get a defamation lawyer involved. So what would be your uh, ideal outcome of all this? Look, my, I've, I've put an olive branch out today here yeah. by jumping ahead and saying, I fired back because I was under attack. Mm. My viewpoint was you're drawing first blood. I'm going to look like a wuss. And I said things that weren't true because I was just getting fed information and throwing it out there because mm. that's what you were doing to me. If I don't do that, I'm going to look weak. Yeah. But now I know that information was false and I take that back. But are you, prefer, are you prepared to do the same because you told me you would and you haven't, which makes the apology hollow. But I would love you to be inspired by what I've said to do something similar. I can I can I can't fault that, mate. Can't we all just collaborate and Isn't share it? guests and boost each other up? Yeah. No, I, I agree, mate. I do. I really... Like, and, and, and if you're in it for yourself, fair enough, be in, be in it for yourself. Like, we all need to... We all need to eat. We all need to achieve. You know, that's fine. But don't mm. come across as someone who's a good guy if that's not the case. If you mm. are going to lie and mix things up. I'm not saying anyone yeah. is. I'm just giving an example of that, innit? Yeah. I think these guys regret doing what they did because... They took some hits. Mm. Yeah. What 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 about Darren G? Because you've had a mad <laughs> like I, I like Darren, you know, and, and I haven't spoke to him since our yeah. interview. But you know, he, he is a he he has he's had a fucked up life, haven't he? Yeah. Uh, how how is how is your relationship now, you two? Look, I, Darren G, much love and respect to him because when those people 
were recruited in the podcast wars to take me down, he was the first one to realize what it had been done to him and come to us and show us the text, message, text messages showing the lies that they told him. Mm. He says, look, I've been played. And we went to meet him. Anything could have happened. I walked into his flat, not knowing what his mindset was that day, yeah. and just looked in his eyes and gave him a hug. And he could see I was a sincere soul. And with Darren, we did numerous collaborations at that point in time. Darren's been through a hell of a trauma. And again, I've read his book as well as Lee Marvin's. Darren's book's never been published. I know. My girlfriend at the time read it. She was moved to tears. I'd love that book to come out. The hell he's been through is up there with what Lee Marvin's been through. And um, my heart went out to him reading that book. And when you are traumatized to that degree, you're not going to behave normally because there's a hurricane in your brain that could just be triggered by anything. And he's got that. And he channels it through working out. All the people I've seen who've survived prison and done well afterwards, many of them, it's through physical activity, boxing, martial arts, working out. He's got the body of a Roman gladiator. He would destroy all those people in the, in the podcast wars if they were ever put in a room with him very easily. He's a powerful individual. I don't know if you saw the video. I was out of breath. Squat. <laughs> Have you seen the videos people have made though if you were like squatting? You know what YouTube's like. I need to see them. Uh, I think I've seen some of them. They're funny. Yeah, so that's that's my opinion of Darren. We did a, a bunch of collaborations with him. He said he wanted to just go on his own. And he's gone on his own. And I've not heard from him for a very long time, but there's no problems with Darren. Okay. No, I I last thing I heard of him, he was on TikTok. And, yeah. good, and good for him. Like, you know, he seems like he's enjoying himself, you know? Yeah. Power to Darren. Power to Darren. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, okay, then. Just maybe just briefly, Michael Franchise, he's here. You're doing a tour with yeah, him now? Yeah, yeah. How's that been? Phenomenal, man. He's selling out across the country. I'm there's coming a... to the Cardiff one. Thank you. Yeah, there's nine uh, gigs. Um, yeah. Conor McGregor's going to the Dublin one. Oh. There's also a sit-down dinner with Conor McGregor and Michael. Wow. If you want to go to that. Um, Joe Kalzaki's coming to the Cardiff one. Oh, I'll have to meet Joe. Yeah. <laughs> At the launch in Holborn, probably half my podcast guests are going to be there. <laughs> Where's one for Holborn? London. Right, really? They're all yeah, probably from... half my podcast guests are going to be there. Wow. There's too many to name. It'd be a good networking event. The Glasgow one has been the biggest seller in the whole country from the get-go. Okay. So all my Scotland uh, guests are going to be at the Glasgow one. It's Ian Blink. Uh, Shout out to Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Um, Ian Blinketh. Ian Blink, McDonald. He's great guy. He's a character, isn't he? We did his book as well. Scotland's Wildest Bank Robber. Yeah. I'm so glad Johnny you've come Boy to Steel. Cardiff, though. I'm, I'm really glad you've come. Well, now we're in this whole area, man. This is this is headquarters now. Yeah. Uh, Bristol, He's South stepping Wales. On, stepping on the toes. <laughs> I'm so glad that we didn't know, but this is what I'm saying. I'm, don't start uh, any podcast wars if you can't. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Listen, I'm all about collaborating, like I said, mate. Yeah, it, 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 that, that's how it should always be. Yeah. You know, um, I think there's a lot of crabs in a bucket mentality with with, mm. with with a lot of people, you know, and yeah, that's not the case, mate. So <laughs> hey, you'll have, you, you, you're coming to the Cardiff one, aren't you? What's the deal? Why, why don't we offer some free tickets yeah. for your viewers okay. who watch this video? Yeah. You decide right now on the spot what qualifies for them to win, and we will supply them with some free tickets. Ooh. <laughs> what do you think, uh, Harrison? <laughs> An obscure one, yeah? Who was the working girl that we interviewed who pissed on a police officer? <laughs> Uh, wrapped in cling film uh, when he came to the brothel. Yeah. If you have, if you prove that you have subscribed and followed us on all social medias and you answer the question of who the guest was who wrapped up a police officer in cling film and pissed on, pissed on the officer and recorded it, if you get that right and show us the proof that you have subscribed, 
you'll win tickets and you will be there to meet Michael Franchise and Sean Atwood and myself <laughs> in person. And it's not every night you get to meet someone who was betrayed in the movie Goodfellas. There's not many of that generation left. No. And again, if you don't know the question, and or you might be too late, you might not be the first five, um, get get your tickets. Where can they get their tickets well, from? Tickets on Eventbrite. If you want me to shoot the link over yeah, in the description box, we'll, I'll, we'll I'll send that over everything, yeah. with my channel link. And um, yeah, we'll look forward to seeing and some of you guys there. Well. Yeah, Cardiff one is, um, I think it's in the middle of March. March. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's the 17th. Yeah, don't, don't keep me hanging on that, but we'll get this out next week. To help push that, then you know we'll yeah, get this on next week. We'll, Appreciate that. We'll, we've got a back date of a few, but we'll move that and get that in before the yeah. the event, innit? Right. you know. And, yeah. and also, if there's any true crime guests that we haven't done that you know you think you've got a good story, then reach out as well because I know that Sean, mm -hmm. you know, being local as well, like you know, as long as it is that fits the criteria yeah. of nitty gritty true crime <sighs> prison stories. Mm -hmm. And get in touch, isn't it? You know, and you know how to tell a, to tell a story. My ideal guest, I just sit there and they just talk. Yeah, Did they, I know I hate talking too much. <laughs> no, I know I, I, I love to have that back and forth yeah, conversation yeah. and, and yeah. put my two pence in. But I've seen some podcasters who just it's all about them, and it's just like, what the fuck, mate? I'm here to watch this guest. <laughs> you know. So okay then, um, future plans. What, what, what have you got in the pipeline? So thinking of getting. Jen settled down to have a sibling. I've promised her. Ooh. She's asked for two dogs for every child. <laughs> <laughs> wow. We'll have to start bringing the dogs in after the Francis tour so we can pave the way for the next sibling. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And we, do you know what? There's so much we, we haven't spoken about, which we may do in the in the future now you're, you're close, but we've got, you know, we've got the Atwood family channel where people can watch the birth as well as all kinds of little videos of Ziggy. We've started a family channel. Oh, that's amazing. Yeah. How's it going? It's only got a low amount of subs because it's new, but the, the people, are, people are really engaged with Ziggy. They love him. Oh, Every time oh. I go live, they're like, get Ziggy, go grab Ziggy. Oh. And I was on a live the other night and he was staring, smiling at the camera and he waved at the end of it. Oh. <laughs> I need to meet Ziggy. <sighs> Yeah, you have done some amazing pieces of work, you know, and I'll just touch on some of these maybe that we can talk about another time, but the yeah. Madeleine McCann, uh, did you do a documentary on that or was it just We're thinking cover? about it, actually. We've done Savile and we've done, um, we, we did one call that got us in trouble with YouTube called um, Hidden UK's Hidden Shadows. That was about elite pedos. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Well, okay, let's, let's, let's find out. What do you think actually happened with Madeleine McCann? Oh my goodness. From all the experience and all the interviews you've done, what's your gathered in? Christian Bruckner goes on trial tomorrow for, not for McCann, for other things. So I've just interviewed a guy who's written a book about Christian Bruckner. And his story alone, with or without McCann, is just off the wall horror. I mean, he did not discriminate between. I'll phrase this carefully for your channel's sake. Doing those monstrous things to children is a thing that we think a class of people do. He would do it to grannies as well. He had an apartment in his car that he bragged could transport a small child. He would turn up in your apartment or house in the middle of the night with weird serial killer looking masks on and... I don't want to get into it, the things that he's done, because the video won't get shared by YouTube. Where is he from then, Christian? Bro German. And this is the one they think is the fit in the bill? Well, there's a lot of different theories. So one camp does, but other camps are staunched it against it and think that this is all a distraction. Um, and and what, what's the other theory? There's multiple theories. <laughs> Give us one of them, um, three. Recently, swingers, that is a theory. What, and something happened accidentally, is it? Or? Okay, so there's a theory of the cow pole or some other anesthetic that was used to kill, not to kill, sorry, to, to make, to sedate, yeah, but ended up killing the kid. And, and then, what, in, innocently sedate or? Because they were doctors. Yeah. Because the cow pole was found and they think that other things may have been used. That's a theory. Okay, that's one. But I mean, if that's, 
Not true. That's horrible, isn't it, for the parents yeah. to say that? Yeah. So I just want to put that in as a, as a disclaimer. So David Icke, speaking about people who have just sat there for an hour listening to us. He is him. wild. I love him. Um, he's great, but we have to take all that down too because of strikes. Yeah. Um, what, what happened in that one? He subscribes to the abduction theory. Abduction of when someone's gone in and... Yeah, and, cr- and possibly not a lone abductor offender, but possibly to a ring. Have you heard the theory of... Um... Yeah, I'd, st- I'd be careful with that on, on YouTube because you, you could get okay. in trouble. Um, this is what I need to learn about you with this stuff. I'll, I'll, I talk, just... I'll talk to you about it after, yeah. So uh, have you watched the documentaries okay. about where... People, PG people, pe- people were commissioned to find Madeline, but what they did find was a ring online and they found all these photos, but Madeline's photos wasn't on it, but all these other photos of these little kids were on it and they contacted the parents and said, look, your kid basically ended up here and that's it. History now, there's, there's nothing we can do. They go in these rings, get used, maybe the organs taken. And, oh, they, they, they do get... yeah. Can you imagine being a parent? Like, <sighs> this is the thing, man. You would you would kill someone if they did anything to your child. So is is that the, is that like the strong theories? Is the abduction, the Carl Paul, the Christian? Does the MI5? They were involved with MI5 and the CIA and conspiracies, and it's all been covered up by the UK government because. There was, there was wow. Every theory under the sun is there because it's not been solved. And what do you think? In what are you closest to believing? <clears throat> so my expertise is in Epstein and Savile because I've researched the hell out of them and written a lot of books on them. With we can I've interviewed a lot of people but have not drawn any conclusion. Okay. Yeah. We'll leave that one then. What about the Epstein one then? What, 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 is that, we've got to be careful So, there. you know, Alex Jones was laughed at for saying there's an island where presidents and billionaires go and, and they, they laughed at him and it all came out it was true. Because I've watched him for many, many years and he, he inspired me. Bohemian Grove, didn't he? Yeah, with, with John Ronson. Ron Johnson, which one is it? <laughs> John Ronson. And, um... Yeah, the most powerful people in the world were honey trapped or compromised in some way by Epstein so he could leverage the knowledge and money to further the agenda of the people he worked for. He was only a middle guy. You gotta ask yourself. Was he a middle guy with perverted yes. a side quest of so perversion? His, his, his perverted inclinations was just what caused his own downfall. Yeah. Okay. So do you think these people at the top, they wasn't just perverts. That was just his way of expressing himself and trapping these people. He tapped into their perversions and compromised them to get leverage over them for the people yeah. he was working for. Okay. Okay. Ranging from the, who's, um, what, who's the guy in the wheelchair? Stephen Hawkins. Him Mad, his, isn't it? Was it dwarfs? Or oh my yeah. gosh. But I heard he was an actual freak. Like he was, uh, I was watching Rogan the other day and they were saying like Stephen Hawking was an actual freak because he could still touch. He could still feel, he just couldn't move. And uh, he was like, <sighs> he loved sex and shit. Like, and you know, I don't know what he could have done, but. It just seems like there's a disproportionate amount of people in power that are inclined towards underage. Yeah. And strange. What the fuck? Um, inclinations i'll just yeah, say yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and and do you think that he is a lot what's your theory on where what what happened yeah i'm pretty convinced he was suicided i don't think he was body doubled because there's a theory that he was body doubled yeah, and he's, he's living on some island with kenneth lay somewhere <laughs> happily ever after i think he was suicided not himself that is that's so Never in the history of that jail have the stars aligned in such a way where two guards have fallen asleep on duty together, the cameras have simultaneously gone out, and everything else is... Yeah. <laughs> oh, it's so interesting. It is know? fascinating, and that's isn't it? Why you do this, that's why you do it so well, because it's something <sighs> fascinated about. And but people, I'm, I'm kind of gagged on it, though, because all that stuff now is on Rumble. 
I would, you still I, remember yourself, I, yeah? I would wake up, do an Epstein video, and some of them would have a million views overnight. I had 60 million views, and it all got struck off YouTube. Because when is 60 million shown? Who, who's watching that? That's the thing Russell Brand said. Once you get so many followers, there are certain things you can't talk about or they come after you. You're a problem. You get eyes are cappied and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, we had to take that off YouTube. Yeah. Yeah, that's a good one. It is yeah. all fascinating, mate, and the yeah. world we're living in at the moment. It's a frightening, frightening time, isn't it? Well, it's always been a case of the people at the top prey on the people at the bottom and information, the people at the bottom always get deceived by the people at the top. But the information age has kind of given us a little glimpse into that world because the things that Savile did, he couldn't get away with in this day and age. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He, I think he would have been shut down much quicker. But the cops we interview say, technologies now give the predators a whole new line of access into every kid's bedroom in the world. Fucking crazy, isn't it? So it works both ways, yeah, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Right, I could talk to you for hours. Um, <laughs> we, we skimmed over most topics. And, uh, you know, I know you, 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 you've got to be somewhere. So I just want to say, first of all, thank you for coming on today. It's, it's been a real pleasure to, to interview someone uh -huh. like yourself who has been a massive part of this, this world of podcasting. You know, your, your footprint will, will forever be in the world of podcasting, not just here, but over America. I was watching, I think it's Matt Wilcox the other day, I think his name is. He was like a, is it Matt Wilcox? The or fraudster. Matt? Yes, Matt Cox. yes, Matt Cox. He's, and, yeah, he's charismatic. You know, they were talking he? about you, you know, yeah, and, yeah. you know, how they discovered this on Sean sure Atwood. And, you know, and I'm just like, oh, you nice. know, the Hollywood crime guy as well. Like, you know, mm. these people, they speak about you, you know, because you, you're known all over for your podcasts mm. and, and the you. work you do. So it's been a real pleasure speaking to you. Um, like, thank you. Um, what we do with all our guests, Sean, yeah. is um, we ask them to leave us with a positive message maybe or just, you know, a, a bit of inspiration maybe uh, in typical Sean Atwood fashion, basically. Look, we all go through things and we all need a yardstick. So, for example, I was publishing a book and my internet was down one morning and I couldn't send an email with the file. I could feel my blood pressure rising every hour the internet was down. I remember my therapist said to me, Sean, if anxiety kicks in, take a step back, breathe, take a nice deep belly breath, calm the cascade of chemicals and remind yourself about the worst things you've ever got through in your life. I thought, hold on a minute. I went six years without internet in Arizona prison and here I am almost giving myself a heart attack. If baby Ziggy can lay there covered in shit and give the most beautiful smile and the most sparkling eyes, what the hell does anything really matter? All this crap that's going on in the world. Marcus Aurelius said, be like the rocks facing the sea and the chaos is the storm at sea and these waves are crashing down upon you but you're remaining as strong as those rocks maintaining your equanimity so whatever shit's going on around you think about the toughest thing you've gone through in your life if you've not gone through anything tough think about baby ziggy covered in shit and get, hopefully it'll make you smile <laughs> One of the best outros we've we've heard, Sean. Oh, cheers, Honestly. Brother. Thanks, man. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Guys, I hope you enjoyed that podcast. I know I did. Um, if you want to go and follow Sean, if you don't already, please head over to Sean Atwood on YouTube, Instagram, Twitter. You want, you yeah, want, we're everywhere. We're everywhere. Under, under my name, yeah. They're everywhere. Sean Atwood, <laughs> S-H-A-U-N. Uh, if you want to go to any of those gigs, if it's not Cardiff, but it's any of the other ones, check out Sean's dates online. Um, and yeah, please leave a comment. And as always, stay central. The Dental Club.